Good morning, everyone. I am calling this hearing to order. For the record, my name is Kendra Lara. I am the District 6 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks. I'm joined this morning by my colleagues, Councilor uh, Aaron Murphy, Councilor Julia Mejia, Council President Ed Flynn, and um, Councilor Frank Baker. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. Today's hearing is on docket number 1032, an order for a hearing to discuss the cleanliness and safety conditions at Clifford Park. This matter was sponsored by Councillor Murphy and Councillor Baker. We will be taking public testimony before the panel has presented. So if you're here with us in the chamber, please make sure that you sign up uh, near the chamber entrance. And for all testimony, please state your name for the record, your neighborhood or affiliation, and try to keep your comments to two minutes. Uh, joining us today from the administration, we have Reverend Mariama Whitehammon, who is the Chief of Environment, Energy and Open Space. Ryan Woods, Commissioner in Parks Recreation. Tanya Del Rio, Director of Coordinated Response Team. Jennifer Tracy, the Director of the Mayor's Office of Recovery Services. Lieutenant Peter Messina, Commander of the Street Outreach Unit. And Captain Dennis Cogavin, did I pronounce that correctly? Beautiful, Commander of District B2. So before turning the floor over to public testimony uh, and then to our panel um, on docket number uh, 1032, I would like to acknowledge that my council um, colleague, Ruth, Lee, Ruth Z. Guijen, has also joined us. Um, and I don't have any letters of absence to read into the record. Beautiful. So I'm going to pass the floor over to public testimony before we hand it over to our panel. We have two folks who are with us on Zoom, and we would like to start with them. Is John Verilli uh, with us on Zoom? Beautiful. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for being here with us today. For the record, can you please state your name and your affiliation and um, you have the floor. Yes, good morning, uh, Councillor. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, join you this morning. My name is John Verilli and I'm the Regional Senior Director for Roxbury Prep Charter School. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity. I'm here today because Roxbury Prep uh, is planning in the current planning stage is to build a brand new high school at 71 Proctor Street on Clifford Park in Newmarket. Uh, our project was recently approved by the BPDA and we're excited about a building in this Roxbury, Prep, Roxbury neighborhood. I've spent the last nine months getting to know the elected officials, community groups, and business leaders who live and work in Newmarket. And I can say that I've never met a more dedicated and motivated group of people who care deeply about their community and are working hard to create change. I want to especially shout out Sue Sullivan, Executive Director of the New Market Business Association, who has dedicated her life to this neighborhood and most recently through the New Market bid, has hired street ambassadors to clean up the park and provide 24-hour security to make the neighborhood safer. But there are countless others, like Dominguez De Rosa and Marla Smith at the South End, Roxbury Community Partnership, Stephanie Merritt and Robert Lewis at the base, Sheldon Lloyd at City Fresh and David Andre at the Red Cross and so many others who are all providing critical resources to this community. I want to thank you, uh, Councilor Murphy and Baker, for holding this hearing today and for continuing to put a spotlight on Clifford Park, which has the potential to be a tremendous asset to so many who live and go to school in Newmarket. It is through these efforts and others like the community gathering back in September led by Representative Miranda and attended by Mayor Wu and Police Commissioner Michael Cox and many in attendance today that will ultimately lead to change and progress in New Market. Creating a safe and welcoming space in and around Clifford Park and the Fairmont train station in New Market are both critically important for the families and students who will be attending Roxbury Prep High School in the coming years. So as a brand new member of this, this neighborhood, we know the need is great and there's a lot of work to be done to make Clifford Park a safe place for our kids. But Roxbury Prep welcomes the opportunity to join these efforts and become a long-term partner in this neighborhood. I wanna thank those who have worked tirelessly for years to create change in Newmarket and for the city council for shining a light today on a problem that has been neglected for too long. Thank you for your time this morning. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Early, for being with us today and, and for your thoughtful comments. The next person that we have um, who is here to testify on Zoom is Sue Sullivan, who is the Executive Director of the New Market Business Association. Sue with us here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Sue, thank you so much for being here with us today. Can you state your name and affiliation for the record? And then you have the floor and you have about two minutes. Thank you. It's Sue Sullivan and I am the executive director of what was previously and still is the New Market Business Association, but more recently the New Market Business Improvement District. Um, and I apologize, first of all, for I had rotator cuff surgery yesterday, so for, I'm not there in person, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on Zoom. Uh, and uh, John really, I have to say, said everything when he talked about the number of partners who have been involved in trying to, to keep the park and the area around the park safe and clean over the last several years. Uh, can't say enough about uh, Domingos and Marla Smith and, and others in the community who have been pushing for, for the park to be to be cleaned up, to be fixed up, to be to be able for the children to play. Um, uh, the base, when they moved in a few years ago, they've been very active. Boston Public Works, the area around the base, around around the uh, park, um, they they keep they constantly are over in that area trying to make sure people are moving and people are um, uh, and that the area is clean. Uh, uh, Boston Police Department, everyone, there are so many people. But what the issue is, is that until we don't have, peop have, have people sleeping in the park overnight and um, individuals who are hanging out doing, um, you know, doing drugs, doing, um, uh, able, to, able to leave needles in the park, it's a continuous uphill effort. Uh, I heard about the, I know D Domingo, I'm sure, will speak about the, the, the young person in the park the other day who um, was stuck by a needle. We have people scouring the park right now for needles two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon of, of our group. Um, even after the two hours in the morning, uh, Boston um, Parks Department has people come and scour it again. And then um, I think people from uh, Tanya Del Rio's area, the end, um, and the, the outreach workers are over there scouring it again. So we are picking up needles every day over there. Um, in the morning, they pick up anywhere between six and 10 needles from the park. I know in the afternoon, they pick up another four or five. So this is, this is you know, it, for a long time, it was a question of we didn't have a lot of resources over there. But now, even with the resources we have over there, I think we still have to be cognizant of the fact that the needles are still showing up there and, and, and all. Um, I'd also just like to speak briefly to the, um, by the way, we are very excited to have Roxbury Prep coming there. We think it'll be very important to have the park even more um, utilized and vibrant uh, for, for a longer period of time each day. And um, we, one quick thing, we, I, I know this park is on the docket to be uh, renovated, um, to be updated and, and a lot of changes made. Uh, I, would, I would say something about the city's procurement laws and I just wanna throw this out there because we had the opportunity a year ago, year and a half ago, to work, not, not a year and a half ago, a year ago, to work very closely with the Cal Ripken Foundation who is willing to come in and work with the city. Um, we, had, we had been talking with Ryan Woods and, 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 and um, about uh, making that happen. And it could have happened in a faster timeline. They come into inner city parks, um, uh, I should say inner city, but well, well in the city uh, public parks that uh, need help. And it could have reduced the price of the new park, of a new park from eight to 10 million down to 4 million. And it would have been full community input. We had met with the community, but because of the city's procurement loss, um, it would have not been possible for the city to be involved to, to have that happen. And, um, 
and also have city money as well as private money in there. Uh, so we would have had to have fundraised for the four million privately um, for upgrades to the park. Now, unfortunately, you know, I, it's it, fortunately it's going to get done with the city city dollars and all. And I'm sure, um, you know, that'll be talked about later in this. But it's just an important thing to take a look at and think about when we're talking about procurement laws, especially when there's a lot of private money available that can help out with with uh, with the parks. That's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue, and thank you for making the time to come and testify today, even um, such a short time after your surgery. I think that it is a testament to your commitment to your community. So I'm, I'm really grateful to have you here. Um, we are going to take public testimony in person now. Um, has this been updated? Yep. Do we have anybody who's been signed into the front? Thank you so much. So we just have one, one person. I think we have one person here that is in person right now. We are going to do public testimony again. Uh, I think that in the spirit of ensuring that the administration has time and you know to respond to the community's concerns, we wanted to do some public testimony um, at the beginning of the hearing and then listen from our panel. Uh, but we are we do have another section for public testimony in case there are people that kind of trickle in um, later on. So the person that I have here, these are all of the panelists. Domingos de Rosa is also here. Domingos, can you please come here to the uh, podium to my left? Thank you for being here today. Today, um, please state your name and your neighborhood or affiliation for the record, and you have the floor. <clears throat> Domingos de Rosa. I'm the president of the Boston Bengals, a resident, a lifetime resident of Boston. I don't know where to start. I'm gonna to try to be as respectful as I can to myself, first and foremost, because enough is enough. The lack of concern by the city council, the mayor, and other departments within the city is the reason why we have a nine-year-old sitting at home taking 28 days of a cocktail. On my way here, he calls me because he's scared of what happened yesterday and the day before after taking a first dose of life-changing medicine. He spent all night in the toilet throwing up. No kid should have to go through that while trying to enjoy a sport or the playground or a park that's the only park in their community that they can use. This is years, decades of neglect. The city has sat back and did absolutely nothing. The little bit that's been done is just a Band-Aid that's been put out there because folks like myself, Marla Smith, Yahida Lopes, Leon Rivera, and countless other community members who have been screaming for support for something that the city created itself. The comfort station was across the street from Clifford Park, in front of the health commission. That was two years ago because of COVID. That park was taken down because we exploited it. We showed the truth of what really goes on within those comfort stations. It's not comfortable for anybody, not even the individuals navigating substance use especially the people in my community who has to witness this to and from work, to and from BMC, in the grocery stores, while going to school, and the folks in this chamber takes it as it's a joke. This should have been handled years ago. The city's response was to put two needle kiosks in a public park as a solution to the issues of needles being left. I visited the governor. He didn't like it. He gave me a harassment order because his wife and his family felt threatened. What the hell? What about us in Roxbury who wake up every day to people overdosing on our doorsteps? Human feces all over our playgrounds. Our cars are being broken into. And meanwhile, folks who live on the other side of the city, their response is, it's not my district. 
Their response is, I can't do nothing. Their response is, you have to talk to the district councilor, Frank Baker. I don't care about the personals that you guys have in this chamber. It's bullshit. Y'all are taking out y'all childishness on the people who need the services. None of the kids at the Boston Bengals deserve what they see day in, day out. How much empathy and sympathy do these kids need to exploit before they're being heard? And they're not being heard, why? Because they're black and brown kids? Because their families are not well off? Because they live in a community plagued with crime? That's what y'all been doing to, to my community for decades. I sold newspapers on Mass and Cass when we were allowed to sell newspapers as kids. I played at Clifford Park for the last 45 years, but I'm not on this panel. I wonder why. You and Aaron Murphy, you guys can take out your personals, you know, elsewhere. It shouldn't be here in this chamber. I don't know Aaron's sister, could care less about what she does on Twitter. But I do care what goes on in my community and the way that you guys handle yourselves in this freaking chamber. I was here for the brawl that none of the counselors stepped up and said anything to, to defuse the situation. Mr. DeRosa? No, no, it's not Mr. DeRosa. Mr. DeRosa? Right now, it's not Mr. DeRosa, because you, you, ha you haven't earned my respect. You haven't done anything as a chair of this committee. You need to learn about what really needs to be done in the city. You do not need to be sitting as a chair of a committee when you're ignorant to the needs of the community. You call your security over, it doesn't matter. But the truth is gonna come out about the bullshit that goes on in this freaking chamber. Mm -hmm. This ain't the end of it. Beautiful. Thank you, Mr. DeRosa, for your testimony. Oh, okay. Like I said, you have to learn my respect. And you you are absolutely, absolutely have all of your right as a member of the city to come and testify, and we appreciate you for coming and sharing. Thank you so much. And sharing your concerns. Let your kids go play at Clifford Park. Bring your family down here and enjoy themselves. <laughs> and see what you see Mr. and what DeRosa? we deal with. It's not fair to my community. Sit here and act like you're actually doing something. You guys could have been handling it. Ten months in the chamber, and all y'all worried about y'all pay increases? Beautiful. We're going to move on now to listen to the administration panel. Again, in the spirit of listening to the community first, we're actually gonna start with Ms. Marla's um, testimony on the panel. Ms. Marla, because you are a panelist, you have five minutes to share your experience. Uh, I just wanna remind everybody that we are here to not only highlight the issues that are happening at Clifford Park, but that our hope is that as a committee chair, we can make some recommendations to the administration of what happens next. And so please tell us what your experience has been. You've been down there doing a lot of work. Uh, and if you have any insight to what you would like to see, please also include that. Okay, <clears throat> my name is Marla Murphy-Smith. I'm a resident of Shirley Street and a neighbor to Clifford Park. I'm a member of the South End Roxbury Community Partnership and also the neighborhood representative on the New Market Business Improvement District Board and a participant on the Roxbury Prep Impact Advisory Group. Thank you for the invitation to testify today. I had a lot to say on this matter and it's, it's in these slightly longer versions of my testimony that I hope you'll read. But the short form is, I speak only from my own experiences but hopefully I echo the concerns of others who aren't able to attend a hearing on a Friday morning. I've tried to sharpen and target my comments, but the situation has had eight years to erode in Clifford Park, so I beg your indulgence. The closing of the Long Island Bridge and the centering of those services in this area is the direct and proximate cause of the damage to Clifford Park where needles, drugs, drug paraphernalia, used condoms litter the ground, along with blood, urine, feces, and vomit. In 2019, there were meetings about rehabbing Clifford, at the same time as the discussions for the improvements to the Garvey Park over in Dorchester. That park was not only planned, but completed, and it's beautiful. And every kid should have a park like that. Clifford has had its 2019 rehab plan scrapped over and over. Let's be real, the unspoken undercurrent for why nothing has been done in Clifford is because Mass and Cass has not been sufficiently addressed. Dozens of other parks have been rehabbed since 2019. Announcements are all over social media. You see it on Facebook, you see it on Twitter, to come see how beautiful Name of Park is. Activities that have been witnessed and recorded in Clifford include drug use, <coughs> drug sales, knife fights, altercations with passers-by, partial and full nudity, prostitution, full-blown sex acts, and plenty of times in front of Domingo de Rosa's Boston Bengals kids, the youngest of whom are about five. That's what children are seeing on the field in Clifford Park while people stand around and wait for the two people engaging in sex to finish in front of children. 
This park is a lawless no man's land. Not just the users, but plenty of others push the envelope on what is allowed to occur. There's public drinking, smoking, extremely loud music at three o'clock in the morning, dogs off leashes pooping all over the park, and all the city does is post another sign, but not enforce the words that are written on it. There's been very little urgency to remediate this situation. We aren't even able to get routine police presence to deter these activities. Do you have to bring gloves and an empty jar to your local park? I do, because odds are high I will need to pick up something disgusting or dangerous. I carry Narcan in my purse everywhere I go. The only way Clifford Park is going to get better is if someone has the courage to put a halt to the open air drug market that has been percolating at Mass Ave and Melnia Cass Boulevard. Clifford Park is a victim of the opioid crisis, but unlike individuals, it can't be urged into treatment or Section 35. It is the ultimate victim of a system that has failed the black and brown community yet again. In the 90s, this community was torn apart by the war on drugs, where a large scale arrest and incarcerate was the norm. There was no mention of recovery or treatment. That method was ineffective. What's going on now is also. The tone has changed with a better understanding that addiction is a disease, not a moral failing. But again, this issue is centered in a majority black and brown community, and that community bears the burden of society's perception of who is to blame. We are victims too. All conversations are centered on the user community, omitting that residents and businesses are impacted by every single decision the city makes. That's how Clifford Park has come to be in the state that it's in today. Bass and Cass does not exist in a vacuum. Neighbors have no recourse and no financial assistance when their property is stolen, they can't afford to replace it, like bicycles or patio cushions. Or the vehicles are damaged and then their insurance premiums increase as a result. No one thinks of that or of us. Shopping is now a customer hostel situation due to retail theft. Fences wrap around everything. You can't use a restroom in South Bay most hours of the day. Our park is no longer the welcome green space it used to be. How much more is Roxbury going to be asked to shoulder so more affluent zip codes can pretend this is not also their problem? A current counselor told the South and Roxbury Community Partnership that this was not his district, so what were we looking to him for help for? What happened to one Boston, or is that just a convenient hashtag for happy things like parties? What is being normalized for Roxbury's kids? That drug users have more rights to the park than kids do? That actions have no consequences or accountability doesn't exist? So what do we want for Clifford Park? Police patrols, routinely and frequently. Zero tolerance for tents, public camping, drug use and drug sales in Clifford Park. Clean both the playground spaces in Clifford Park frequently, daily if necessary. Users sleep on as well as engage in sex on the playground structures. Return the benches to the tot lot because drug users are just using the playground equipment anyway. All of Clifford needs weeding, mowing, edging, without waiting till it's overgrown or someone calls 311. But especially around the benches at the baseball diamond on Norfolk Avenue and at the bleachers at the diamond near Shirley Street. The leaves around the tennis court and in the two playground spaces need to be removed, not just leaf blown into piles. This ground cover hides needles, glass, and other dangers. All of this needs to be ongoing routine maintenance, not just a once and done event. We need help from the Commonwealth and the federal government. There have been several significant settlements from Big Pharma and the wealthy families who are well invested there. Some of those funds should be made immediately available to begin the healing and renovating of Clifford Park. This primarily black and brown community should not be used as Boston's dumping ground for things other neighborhoods don't want and have the political capital and clout to shout down. That's not equity focused and it's not fair. Decentralization of services would be a good start in acknowledging that if addiction doesn't discriminate, then the treatment and recovery services don't either. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marilyn. I really appreciate your, um, your testimony. And um, I did pass out your written testimony to the rest of the counselors. Uh, can you confirm for me that your specific recommendations and requests were also in that written paper? Yes, they are, along with a few others. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, we're gonna pass it on to the administration now. Um, I'm gonna go from left to right unless you want other folks to speak first. Chief White Hammond. Chief White Hammond, yes. please state Good your, your name um, for and your position for the record and you have the floor. Sure. Good morning, my name is Reverend Mariama White Hammond. I'm the Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Space for the City of Boston. I am here in my role and also because I live in walking distance from, to Clifford Park. 
I work across the street from Clifford Park, and because I walk on my walk to and from work, I can attest to many of the things that I've heard people say directly. I too have um, happened upon people in the middle of an act and, and sort of said, wow, okay, that's what is happening in this moment. I shop at Target, I shop at Stop and Shop, I see people walking out with bags full of stuff that I know we will find on the street. And um, I appreciate that you uh, mentioned the war on drugs because I lived through that. I saw the difference in how uh, that was executed. I visited family and friends at Concord, Shirley, Bridgewater, Nashua, and South Bay, all because of the war on drugs. And I do feel um, a tension because I also grew up in harm reduction. That is how I know uh, Councilor Mejia as a young person. And I believe deeply in the idea um, that criminalization is not the answer, but I also feel that we are struggling to find the balance. Um, I think what I experienced in the 90s didn't work, but I also agree that we're struggling to find something that does work, um, and it is certainly a challenge. When we talk about Clifford Park, we're not just talking about Clifford Park, we're actually talking about mass and cast and the opioid crisis um, and the way it's unfolding in our community. So you're gonna hear about a number of things that folks are doing. Um, I have been in this role for 18 months uh, and I have watched um, that there is a big difference from where we were 18 months ago to where we are now. That being said, we are not where we need to be. I am hoping that in this conversation, um, what we can really focus on is where do we want to, to go. Um, there are some specific things that have been raised about the renovation process, some challenges, gate, no gate, how do people get in if we gate, do we want to raise the fence higher, what does that mean for our children? when the fences are raised so high that they're beyond their height. Um, I do want to note that there are some things that have been relatively easy solutions. There were a matter of hiring people and getting people out there with certain skill sets. I also think there are things where I've been in multiple meetings where I'm not sure we have good or easy solutions. So we are open, we're open to trying some new things, as was mentioned. We took the benches out because we thought it would improve things. It only made things worse. Um, and so I do, I, would, I do think it would help to acknowledge um, that more could have been done earlier, more has been done now, and that some of the things we have done haven't worked in the way that we intended for them to, or they just haven't been enough. So, You'll hear from a number of different colleagues talk specifically about what they're doing, um, but I am definitely interested in a deeper conversation, particularly about places where we've made changes and they haven't worked out. What is our next approach? Um, to your point, Marla, I'm willing to see if we should just put the benches back. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, you know, No, I know, but I'm, I do. I mean, it, it hasn't made things better. No, and I so agree. So I appreciate it if you just put the damn benches back. I, I hear you. I guess what I want to acknowledge is that we took them out because folks thought that they would work. We thought it might work. It hasn't. <laughs> so, um, and in so much as we can try to find ways to keep addressing those, um, I think it can not fix the whole situation. Because as you said, it's much bigger than Clifford Park, but it can at least improve it. Thank you, Chief White Hammond. Would you like to pass it on to one of your colleagues to? Yes, I'm passing it to Ryan. Commissioner Woods, do you mind for the record introducing yourself and you have the floor? Sure, Ryan Woods, Commissioner of the Boston Parks and Recreation Department. Um, it's been great to engage with uh, many neighbors and residents about issues at the park. Uh, I've taken plenty of notes today for additional maintenance that still needs to be done, including returning benches. Um, 
there is an RFQ, a request for qualifications out right now for um, design firms to apply for the redesign of um, Clifford Park. Uh, we're gracious that the council voted to support giving design funds in this past fiscal year 23 budget. So we will start that community process for the design um, once we pick the qualified designer through the process. And we'll start those community meetings, have robust community conversations, what sports should be there, what kinds of materials, what kinds of fields, et cetera at the park, um, and we anticipate that process to start late winter and through the spring uh, with the community process. Uh, we're looking at measures, as the chief mentioned, of adding some gates in some certain areas that um, seem to be areas where they have more negative activity in the park, um, and make sure that it's open for the community to come in from the Norfolk Drive, from the Shirley Street side, still from Mass Ave side by Liquorland side, um, but looking at gates on the Proctor Street side uh, where there seems to be a lot of negative activity in that place. So um, we're working on those. We're excited about um, the uh, money coming in to renovate the park and look forward to those renovations. Thank, Thank you. you, Commissioner Woods. Ms. Del Rio, can you introduce yourself for the record, please, and you have the floor? Sure. My name is Tanya Del Rio. I'm the director of the coordinated response team out of the mayor's office. I want to zero in and focus on a piece of what my colleague Chief White Hammond just mentioned, and that's we, we don't have the silver bullet. This is not a simple challenge. This is going to take a lot of effort, and it's going to take um, a number of efforts that I want to list. And the first one is coordination and collaboration, both internal, which is what I'm in charge of and uh, an ongoing effort that we have every day, but the collaboration is also with folks like you, Marla, Domingos, Jahaira, uh, Leon, and everyone. So I wanted to thank the community for their stewardship of the park, and um, it's the first thing that that's gonna take. Now, other efforts that it's gonna take and that I'm Personally, and I know I speak on behalf of team members that we're always going to be offering is, is the following, an effort to be responsive. We want to be in constant communication and have done our best effort to always take this kind of input and implement it, um, as you said, try new things, because the answers are not easy. We're gonna ha we have been offering an effort to be present physically in the park. Uh, my colleagues will detail who, at what time, and for what, uh, but we do have a daily ongoing presence of many teams and that's gonna continue and we'll continue to offer it. An effort to be transparent, an effort to transparently say, as you just said, hey, we tried this, it didn't work, let's go on to the next thing. I think that's important. I think that's gonna help the city build trust with the community and get us to a place where you will understand that we do have a concern and we do believe, just like you do, um, that every single child, every single community member that frequents that park deserves a safe environment. We really do share that concern and really do believe that. Um, I wanna do also note that equity is a focus of ours and the points you touched on, Marla, about um, a neighborhood disproportionately bearing a burden of a citywide, region-wide, national challenge um, is something that we take a lot of in, in, into account and it's something that we're putting a lot of work to and resources into this park. So again, appreciating the community stewardship. Uh, just to detail on a little more specifics, the teams that are active at the park, um, obviously the Parks Department, Boston Public, Public Health Commission, especially the Sharps team and the Recovery Services Outreach team, Boston Police Department, uh, District B2 under Captain Coggevin, and the Street Outreach Unit, unit under Lieutenant Messina, Public Works, and then our external partners like the New Market Bid. All of these organizations have to work together on a daily basis. It's my job to make sure that communication happens. Um, if anything ever goes wrong, please, um, I want to be responsive. I'll just say a word or two um, about the city's general uh, approach to the public health crisis that we're facing at Mass and Cass just to uh, provide some context and information if people want to follow up on and then I'll, I'll let my colleagues speak about their own work. But I wanted to make a note that we are sharing ongoing up-to-date stats about the number of people present, about the number of people going into treatment, the number of people uh, being um, housed in low threshold housing, permanent supportive housing, all of the different components of our response in our public dashboard that's available at boston.gov slash mass and cast. You can check it every week. You'll see the information so that you're up to speed on what the situation is. 
Um, I do want to know, many people are coming to the area and they are receiving services and each person with this population is going to have unique needs. That is the nature of um, substance use disorder, mental health challenges and um, other challenges that they're facing. And so the city is trying to tailor that so that each person can be successful in their own journey um, and working constantly to connect them. Um, lastly, I'll say again, uh, this is a team effort and we fully see the community as part of that answer. And so um, thank you for hosting the hearing, City Council. We, we look forward to working together on, on solutions. I'll give it to Jen. Thank you so much. Can you please introduce yourself for the record? You have the floor. Sure. Good morning, Chairperson Lara, members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Tracy. I am the Director of the Office of Recovery Services at the Boston Public Health Commission. I want to take this time today to speak about the work of recovery services doing in and around Clifford Park. Um, as you know, we have a, a large footprint in the neighborhood, um, as well as our efforts, newer efforts to expand access to substance use um, across Boston neighborhoods. We know that discarded syringes at Clifford Park are a matter of grave concern. And the Boston Public Health Commission takes the issue of needle disposal very seriously. We have worked to build a comprehensive approach for addressing needle disposal in the city that is an integral part of our harm reduction infrastructure. In the fiscal year 2022, we took in 189% more syringes than we gave out. The Commission, through our AHOPE Access Harm Reduction Overdose Prevention and Education Program, does run one of the busiest and longest standing drug user health programs in the state. AHOPE pl plays an important role in preventing sharps from being inappropriately discarded. Um, and at the drop-in site alone, they have collected over 650,000 syringes. We work with clients um, and drug users to help them understand the importance of safe needle disposal. We provide personal biohazard containers that can be returned to us um, at any of our locations or dropped off at a sharps kiosk. We've continued to increase the needle kiosks across the city and implemented the Community Syringe Redemption Program started in December of 2020, providing stipends to people for collecting syringes. The program currently serves the Newmarket, Nubian, and downtown neighborhoods, and in fiscal 2022, it collected over one million syringes. The Mobile Sharps team um, started in 2014, expanded in 2017, um, and expanded now, uh, in addition to the team, uh, the entire staff is trained on needle pickup, including the outreach team and other staff members. Our staff do proactive sweeps in high areas with high volume public drug use like Clifford Park, specifically um, Orchard Garden School, Mason. Efforts are continuously monitored and adjusted to respond to target areas of particular need. The Sharps team prioritizes needle pickup calls in parks and schoolyards, and we routinely conduct outreach in Boston neighborhoods. Um, to collect improperly discarded syringes across the city. Clifford Park is a priority site and is proactively swept at 6.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m., and 5 p.m. daily by our team, in addition to the other sweeps that uh, Sue Sullivan mentioned with the cleaning crew um, and Tanya and her, her team are doing as well. Our outreach team in the neighborhood um, also canvases uh, the area prioritizing um, high-need high areas. The team engages with individuals on the street, transporting them um, by van or walking to area services, responding to overdoses in the area, um, collecting syringes, and directly coordinating with uh, the city team, homeless shelters, and other community providers. We recognize, um, though, that sites like Clifford Park have seen a disproportionate impact from substance use disorder issues. In response, the city of Boston and the Public Health Commission have made a number of recent investments and initiatives expanding access to substance use services and recovery supports across Boston neighborhoods. This includes the establishment of two new daytime spaces offering harm reduction services and medical and treatment referrals at the Whittier Street Community Health Center and at Victory Programs uh, Boston Living Center in the Back Bay. Another initiative that expands services to neighborhoods across the city is the creation of neighborhood engagement teams, which was piloted in Nubian Square this past year um, and will continue in Nubian Square, engaging individuals experiencing substance use and housing issues and referring them to services and interacting with local businesses. The teams will be led by Torchlight Recovery Group in Nubian Square and East Boston Community Health Center in East Boston. We look forward to continuing the, to work with the council, um, the constituents, um, residents to um, tackle this issue 
um, head on um, as it requires you know, all of us here and uh, look forward to hearing suggestions and seeing how we can contribute more. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to hand the floor over to um, Boston Police Department. Either would you like to have a specific order? Captain, please, you have the floor. Good morning, Council Laura. Thank you. Um, I'm Dennis Coggivan, the captain of District B2 with the Boston Police. Uh, thank you, Councilor Murphy and Councilor Baker for having this hearing today on Clifford Park. It's clearly an emotional and passionate issue in the neighborhood. I know there's a lot of concerned residents and uh, business owners in the area that would like to see progress down there. So it's great that we're having this hearing today and having an opportunity to share thoughts and, and uh, listen to people that have, uh, have good stuff to say about it. Um, I just briefly say that what we do down there from District 2. Um, we provide 365 day, 24 hour a day uh, police services down there. What we do, our main mission is to uh, promote public safety and that's to make sure the neighborhood and the park and the area down there is safe for people to be. Um, we also provide visibility and a deterrence when people see the police officers down there. Um, and then the third thing we do is we're providing support to our partners from public health and the parks department while they conduct their roles down there. Um, we do this through several methods. Um, we're down there, we, we assist in the morning at 6.30 with their cleanup of the park, uh, the Department of Public Health with Tanya Del Rio and Michaela Nee's team. Um, they, they've, been, uh, they've been pretty helpful. I found the relationship that we've had over the last several months to be very helpful with us coordinating efforts. Um, Tanya's great listening to calls. I think that has helped over the last few months us make a better effort. Uh, I'm not going to say it's perfect. I think it's far from perfect, but we continue to strive to make it better. And uh, thank you, Tanya. Um, so, I'm sorry. Excuse me. There is no speaking from. They watch people have sex and their responses. We got to wait for them to be. I got tons of videos. So y'all can fluff the fluff all y'all want. We know we who watch this happen sees it. We see the truth with the B2 response from the police station, why these kids are trying to practice and people are shooting up in front of them, having sex, and the officer's response is, we can't do nothing because our superiors tell us we can't. So don't sit here and bullshit the bullshit. So, so actually to his point, um, obviously public safety is first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, that um, the public health crisis that's in the city, we've tried to prioritize. I think we've mentioned how um, drug addiction and, and drug sales have been dealt with in the past, which was the 90s. Um, we found that incarceration may not be the best way to handle this. There's a new model, which is a public um, health approach, and that's the approach that we've been trying to support. Um, I think we've been doing an okay job. I, I would agree we could do better. Um, but that being said, I don't think we are going to be able to arrest our way out of this issue. Um, so we've been trying to walk a delicate line, whether it's um, a, a, a crime that's worthy of being arrested for or a crime that someone might actually need services for. And, and that's the problem. We get, the police get caught in the issue of um, we should do something when people want a certain crime charged in a certain place. And that same may not be um, dealt with or have the same beliefs somewhere else. So it, we're, we're walking a delicate line of our policing model, and it's a very challenging time, and it's clearly a challenging issue down there, particularly around the park, because the model is public health crisis, and that's, and that's how we've been dealing with quality of life crimes. Um, that said, we, uh, so the district level is built to answer radio calls and to provide vi visibility in the area. We've also reached out to some of our internal police partners to help us out down there, and those aren't necessarily the things that you see all the time, but, but they are, and I promise you, they are going on down there. Um, Lieutenant Messina and the street outreach team um, is clearly the most visible and the most active uh, Boston police presence down there, and uh, he can speak to what his unit does. But we also have had human trafficking their unit down there with uh, Sergeant Mark Sullivan, who's in charge of that. They spend quite a bit of time down there. We have several um, drug control units throughout the city, the District B2, who are assigned in Roxbury. They spend time down there. And then we have um, a couple citywide units that are available, and they spend quite a bit of time down there. We also have our, our bike unit. Um, they spend time down there. I'm trying to get to somebody else. Oh, and, uh, and the Youth Violence Strike Force. So 
there's other resources from the police department that are available and they spend a tremendous amount of time down there. So if you just see a blue uh, and white police car with a police officer, I would venture to say that there are more people around there that you don't realize are there. And there is a continuing effort from those units to uh, improve the quality down there. And again, we, we could do better, but um, we, we are making a full scale effort. Thank you, Captain. Excuse me, Marla, that is not, let's just be very clear. Let's take a pause for a second about what is happening here. We are at a hearing of a committee of the Boston City Council. There is public testimony. When you give public testimony, you have two minutes to speak. Who is on the panel and who speaks on this floor is at the discretion of the chair, which is me. If you have a question, you ask the question through the chair, which is me. This is not a place for a back and forth between people who are here watching or between the panelists. That is the structure of a hearing. If you want to have a back and forth conversation, then the actual structure for that is a community meeting that people can attend where you can have a conversation. This is a hearing. We are hearing from community members who are on the panel and we are hearing from the administration about what they're doing. It will be followed by questions from the counselors and then we will have more time for public testimony. So there is no back and forth. There is no question of questions. And if you do have a question, it needs to be asked to the panelists through the chair. Because there's obviously a difficulty here with keeping the order. And if we're going to get anything done today, we're going to have to make sure that we're following the process that we have outlined for our committees. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank I was you. Before this meeting and I wasn't, so I'm sorry if I were, were No, nope, not at all. No, 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 not at all. Thank you, Marla. Now, uh, Captain, are you all set? Yes, I'm all set. Beautiful. <laughs> Ron, can you please turn his mic? No, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, floor. Thank you. It's uh, great to see a lot of you today. Uh, thank you, City Council, for having us here and, and allowing this testimony uh, this morning. So what I'm going to do is just provide you with a quick overview of what the Street Outreach Unit does, uh, how many officers we have, and what we do down at Clifford Park this morning. Uh, the mission of the unit, our street outreach unit, is to promote community-based outreach through partnerships, collaboration, collaboration to those affected by mental illness, substance use disorder, and homelessness in a professional, humane, and supportive manner. The unit aims to connect those individuals to services prior to them engaging in criminal activity. The SOU consists of eight patrol officers, one sergeant, and one lieutenant, which is myself. Uh, Clifford Park, uh, we, are, we are in the park. Um, Monday through Friday, we have two shifts. We have a day shift and we have an evening shift. Day shift consists of 7.30 to 4. Evening shift is 4 to 11.45. Uh, we, on the day shift, personally, we walk that park every day, uh, engaging in individuals that are in the park uh, and obviously being cognizant of needles or anything in the park that needs disposal. Um, we are fortunate to have a great relationship uh, and be part members of the coordinated response team uh, with Tanya Del Rio and the rest of the staff here. Uh, at this table. Uh, we are collaborating daily at 8.45 in the morning on these calls. So if any issues come up overnight uh, or whenever in Clifford Park, we are discussing those issues and, and allocating resources to those issues. Um, each day, the day tours, like I said, walks the park to make sure there's no needles, there's no trash there. And if there are, we call them in. Mm -hmm. My evening shift, we make sure that the evening shift is out there at 4 o'clock, between 4 and 5 o'clock, showing visibility, engaging any individuals out there and at the close of shift to make sure there's no one preparing to sleep in the park or sitting up in the park. Uh, we are, I know I've met a lot of you at community meetings, so um, we have most in this room here that are involved in the community have my contact information, so if anything comes in, uh, it gets processed through the coordinator response team. Um, and I'm available for questions. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, I am, um, one second. I am going to pass it over um, to the council for um, a couple of rounds of questions. I am going to start with the lead sponsors of this hearing order, which is Councillor Murphy and Councillor Frank, Frank Baker, and then we're going to go to the rest of the council in the order of arrival. I also want to clarify, Ms. Marla, that that statement was not for you. You are a panelist on the floor, and if you want to speak, you just have to press your button. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, that was, no, there were other people who were about to speak when you spoke up. Yes, not, not, that was not for you. Beautiful. But if you do, if you want to speak, you just have to press your button, and I will call, and then you have the floor. Um, Tanya, did you have your light on, or are you all set? Yes, yes. I, I just wanted to 
Can you hear me? Yeah. There you go, yes. I just wanted to restate that we do have an ongoing police and public health presence at the park, and that the approach is a balance of the two. We have to provide public safety for the community and for everyone that frequents the park, mm -hmm. and we have to lead with public health as an answer for people who are struggling with substance use and mental health, because that's what the evidence has shown that works. So that's the approach that we had, and I wanted to clarify that we do have that presence. Beautiful. Thank you, Ms. Del Rio. Uh, I'm going to start with questions. I'm going to start with the lead sponsors. Councillor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, panelists and the community who are here for this important hearing. Myself and Councilor Bank Baker sponsored this hearing because we, I have seen that the cleanliness and safety conditions of Clifford Park, which we know is only one mile away from the Mass and Cass neighborhood, has become a public safety hazard to nearby residents, students, parents, senior citizens, sports players, and the general public. In recent years, Clifford Park has become an open drug market and a large gathering space for homeless people with substance use and mental health issues. Many of you have already spoken about these concerns. At one point, there were as many as 30 tents in Clifford Park. We don't see that now, so there has been progress. But there is still a concern of people sleeping in the park. Large amounts of trash can scatter the park at any day, during any part of the day. And as I know, and many of the people in this room know, that that trash includes drug paraphernalia, the needles, condoms, feminine products, and even human feces. Needles hide in the mulch, which make it almost impossible to find all of them, even though I do know there are many people out there, many different departments doing sweeps and picking up as many as they can. One thing we learned from COVID is the value of open space for our health and wellness, especially for our children. It's extremely upsetting to hear that a nine-year-old boy who was playing football at the park was pricked by a needle. We know that this park is critical for the community and the students nearby. The Mason School is there. On the first day of school, I was near the park and I did see the kids come across the street and play in the park that's closest to Smith Street, and it was great to see. And we heard from um, Roxbury Prep, it's exciting that we have the high school coming. So we're also going to have high school students, hopefully playing high school sports in that park. This hearing order is not to blame. I have personally witnessed the hard work from several city departments, from Sue Sullivan in the new market bid. And they are she's even prioritized funds from that bid to have cleanup crews come through the park daily. So knowing that the current condition at Clifford Park is a disservice to our residents, last month people in Roxbury unofficially closed Clifford Park. It brought a lot of attention to the park. I know that they felt that they needed to do something extreme, even though you know day in and day out that you're addressing the issues there. The residents feel like they're not being heard. So me as a city councilor and others here, I know we talk a lot about making sure that we remember our job is to present, represent the citizens and make sure that they have a voice here in City Hall to be able to talk and listen to what departments are doing. I just want to be clear before I turn it over to my other counselors for questions that my objective for this hearing has been and continues to be to hear from local constituents, community leaders, and the public about their experiences in the park. If I'm there one day driving through, like you said, um, doctor, that you go through that park, Reverend, I'm sorry, um, you know, walking through, you have seen things happen as a resident near that park. To listen to city officials who are here with us today and to hear directly from them what they are doing and to adjust that plan if needed to bring more attention and services to this park so we restore an equitable and safe place for the residents in Roxbury and any other resident in the city who's there. And I hope that this hearing will continue to, will be able to continue to collaborate and to prevent any further problems like Clifford Park, because we know that the issues that we see at Mass and Cass are spreading. I think any district councilor or at-large councilor in this space now could talk about a park near their neighborhood, near their home that is starting to see some of the same concerns they have. So. Thank you for being here, and I'll turn over my time to other questions from councilors. Thank Beautiful. you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam, Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, I just have to say, you go, girl. Good job in reining that in. Good job. Um, so a couple things here. I <clears throat> We talk about the public health and the public safety thing, and we're focused on the public health um, approach. 
I think our approach that we're taking now is not working. I think it's too heavy public health. I think that I'm all about second chance, third chance. We're talking about 50th chance down there, 60th chance down there. We did a lot of work in um, previous years to set up things like the satellite court that would help us with Section 35. We can't even really have a discussion about a Section 35 without being yelled down about how we can't arrest ourselves out of this. I've actually sectioned people in my family back when you went to Bridgewater and the screws beat you up in there. I did it. Did older sister, older brother, people in my family. That isn't what it is. That isn't what it is now. Until we change the way we are operating, we are basically setting up Mass and Cass for a five year long hospice. Everyone down there, if we view them as they're on hospice, when people are going through cancer, when they're at end of life, we shoot them with morphine and they, we slow them, we slowly put them on the other side. That's what we do. How is it different near here? How do we take the, the tents off the street Put them in the, in the Roundhouse Hotel. If nothing changes, nothing changes. How do we think something's gonna change? It's not going to change. Unless we, unless we come up with real plans, satellite courthouse, real section 35, real, real section 12 beds. We have Nashua Street half empty. We have South Bay half empty. We could come up with one of those buildings. I would like to see it at Nashua Street. Totally done over as a, as a facility that's rented out Suffolk County runs it out to DPH. They, they operate it as a Section 35, Section 12 um, operation where now when you get someone thinking somewhat clearly after, if someone's shooting poison in their veins for 10, 12, 20 years, what makes us think that they can make decisions that are best for them in their lives? Yes, it may be, yes, it may be tough love, but to some degree, we have to stop with the coddling, and we have to do some tough love. But I would think that if we had real programs set up, real programming set up where people could go and even self-check, one of the things that's happening when we're not bringing people into the courthouses, we're not looking to arrest everybody, but we're looking to divert people into treatment. We're not diverting anybody in treatment because you're allowed to do what you want. And as far as the tents are concerned, in my opinion, that was a concerted effort, a concerted effort on a part of who knows to come down there and set those tents up. They all happened on right across from, from 112 in front of the um, fire department headquarters, which is a whole nother can of worms. We send our, our employees at the fire department in a 1010 mass into harm's way every day. That's not even talking about the Mason School and the other schools that are around there. Um, what's in your district? Orchard Gardens. Orchard Gardens. Thank you. Thank you. We, we, we are unable, we are unable to take control of this situation. We're following the lead of other cities, San Francisco, LA. I'd like to get an answer of how much we've spent in just the roundhouse. How many millions of dollars have we spent in the roundhouse to take care of how many people? 200 people? 200 people, and I'm offended because we have now, the Clarity Pool the other day needs $30 million. Grove Hall is gonna need $30 million for their community center. Um, I had a formal ask for a, for, a, for a new Boys and Girls Club that would help to speak to these societal ills before they end up on, on the street, before they end up on drugs. This problem isn't going away, it isn't getting any better, and as long as we allow and we, and, we, and we reward poor behaviors, we're on this treadmill that we're not gonna, we're not gonna get off. Yes. So we wanna get, very simple, do we wanna get needles out of Clifford Park? Are your outreach workers handing needles to people in Clifford Park? There has to be places that are community places. Yes. And it's not just Clifford Park. If you go up to Columbia Road at the, uh, at the, the Pierre statue there, Blake House, historic house, a very fir the, the oldest house in Boston, homeless all over the place, shooting up there, shooting up there, having sex there, using the whole place as a, as a bathroom. That's in Andrew Square, that's in Dudley Square, that's all over Mass and Cass. And we, the communities, met, um, the South End, I had never seen it. it, it, it once COVID started happening, it, it ended up being 
calls over and over and over, didn't just stop at, at, at COVID, but really bad, over and over and over. They're using my front steps as their bathroom. They're using my backyard as their bathroom. We couldn't even get bathrooms on the street because we were, we were back and forth so much and the city wouldn't fund them. What are we doing? We're rewarding poor behaviors. Now, question, Tanya. Has there been any movement on the coordinated response through the bid? Now, the bid happened in part through my office. The shops team in part through my office, direct, directly advocating across the hall with the mayor to, to set up the shops team. Because before that team was open, before that team was in place, you called 311 and you'd get a fire, a fire truck and an ambulance there talking about ways to city services, directly out of, directly out of my, my office. The bid, directly out of my office. The stands, with help from Ryan and Chris before you, we removed those stands there. Does anybody remember the, 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 the yes, concrete know. stands? They were an absolute disaster. Those are things that we've done. We do I'm not, not keep saying the city the department, I'm removed. not finished yet, buddy. I'm, I'm not, not saying finished. that the city departments aren't doing their work. Public Works is down there constantly. Whole dumpsters full of trash, garbage, because people that don't know the problem are coming in and feeding people and giving them more clothes. And like, you're homeless. How do you generate so much trash? How do you have so many clothes? I know maybe that's being a little, a, a little mean or a little rough, but at what point are we gonna stop and get real with this? Let's set up Section 35 programs, real Section 35 programs that aren't about just locking people up and throwing them away. We're in 2022 now. A lot of things are being done differently. We know that mental health is going to be, is the number one problem in our society right now. From little kids to older people, through the whole, through all of our generations. And we allow this to continue to happen. Budgetarily speaking, I'd like to get a number of where we are with Roundhouse and all the other hotels. Now we're going into neighborhoods and communities and saying, well, we think that this is the way, so we want to set up a hotel in your neighborhoods, all around the neighborhoods, we want to set them up, but the city can't give us surety that they're not gonna take people out of a tent and right into those hotels, which is what they did at the Roundhouse. Which is what they did at the Roundhouse. Wrong, wrong. We need to intervention and treatment first, and then we'll start talking about where we, what hotels we put you in. As far as the, the, the plan for, for Clifford, it was a public-private partnership that was generated through, through the, the base we're, gonna, we're, we're looking to, because when you bring private money in, the public, um, we can get things done, done quicker. The person that was the funder there was a little bit difficult. They were heavy on baseball and they wanted to put a fence around the entire property. I wasn't in favor of the fence, but I'm starting to wonder now, should we put a fence there? And then the Mason School gets a key, and then the, and then the, 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 the Roxbury Prep gets a, pee, a, a key, and what they do in San Francisco, I wouldn't follow anything that they do, but one of the things they do, they have a, 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 a coordinated response team that's in their own space that, 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 so people go out and respond from a centralized location. We have the spaces, we can do it. It's something we could, something we could do. They put fences around there and the people that are formally on the street and formally incarcerated have a key that worked for the bid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Baker. And just to, to be clear for the record, you have questions around for the administration around how much is being spent um, for on the on the roundhouse. I don't know if somebody can answer that in terms uh, yeah. of. I, I would also like to hear um, just about kind of like the progress for that because it was a, a project. I, I have a hotel in my district as well where we have people there. So just um, to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, is that it? That's the. Yes, that okay. would be a, a number on what we're spending in just the roundhouse because that's one that's right there. And I believe that if the roundhouse. And that started out, Madam Chair, if I could, yes. as a, as a, floor. Can you as a, a um, Thank you. as a first with Pine Pine Street, we we're going to get through. We we're going to get through COVID, and Pine Street was great in that. But I, I was right there for it. They said, "Well, these are people that are further along in their experience with Pine Street, meaning they are the closest to and the most healthy 
towards getting into a home and being able to sustain themselves in a home. 175 people, that was Pine Street early in. And then when it turned into what it is now, it was gonna be six months, we need to get through, we need to get through the winter. Then it, and now in the MOU, which we can't get a straight answer out of anybody on is, it was a one year renewal, a two year renewal, and then an option to buy. If that place is bought and is continued to operate the way it operates, then goodbye, all the park, goodbye to that park down there, and the schools are always gonna be talking about what we're talking about now. If nothing changes, nothing changes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baker. And so there's also a question around clarity around the MOU and the process for either purchasing how long, how long the contract is and so on. Ms. Del Rio, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Councillors. Um, okay, so the total annual cost to operate the roundhouse, it's $7,487,000 for the shelter, there is 5,600,082 for the clinic for a total of a little over 12 million, $13 million. Do you want any of the other Can sites? you clarify the MOU with the Roundhouse or any of the other yes. hotels and talk I about it? Yes, I don't have too many updates to bring on that one except for we have committed funding for fiscal year 23 through the end of fiscal year 23, so that's June of next year. Mm -hmm. And we are actively looking for new sites so that we can de decentralize and make sure this low threshold housing is available citywide. Um, so I for would right like now, to. The contract for the low threshold housing is until June until 2023. For the roundhouse. For the roundhouse specifically. specifically. Yeah. yeah. I did want to add to that just a little bit around the results for these sites. and. Uh, one second. Yeah, just respectfully disagree about their effectiveness. I think they are a wonderful resource that is really helping people get back on their feet. So I did want to provide some information about that. We currently are housing 185 people at the six low threshold sites. For context, we on this week, on average, have had 179 people, between 148 and 179 people present any day on the street. We currently have 185 in the low threshold housing sites. Um, their stay is long because it takes a long time to stabilize after being in active use. Um, and as we said, a lot of times there are co-occurring mental health challenges that people are facing. But we have placed 50, 62 people so far um, in permanent housing from those sites. I do also want to share some treatment and other numbers from the sites. Um, as of August, this is the latest figure I have, 49% of the residents there are act actively engaged in substance use disorder treatment uh, through medication, and 35 are receiving non-medication treatment. 64% of the residents are receiving primary medical care, um, which and many times they didn't, they didn't have before, and 30% are engaged in mental health care, which is uh, great progress for them. And um, as of September 22, that's the most updated figure I have. 90% of the people on the sites have engaged with a housing navigator, 85% have a housing plan in place, and 57% have a housing resource in hand, like a Section 8 voucher or similar, so they're on their way to permanent housing, which will allow us to refer more people into those sites, definitely directly from Southampton Street and surrounding. Just to be clear, that is for the people, that those percentages are for the people who are living in the low threshold housing buildings. Correct. Beautiful, yes. not the people who are out on Mass and Cass. Correct. Correct. Councillor Baker, you yeah, have one quick, last question. I want quick follow-up question. So you had seven million for, for a yearly operational bill, budget, five million on, on the medical. What was the initial, what was the initial going in there? So that's a, that's a yearly, you'll get in there, it's gonna cost us seven million. What was our cost, the city of Boston's cost, going in there when we first went in there? And again, at 12 million, 185 in six sites, we're only talking about 12 million for that one site, there's six sites, so are we talking 60 million, 70 million, 80 million for those sites? What, what is the number? When I think if we spent it proactively on Grove Hall, Clarity Pool, Columbia Point Field House, I'd like to see 60 million going, 20 million each for those. Those are all built in a couple years if we, if, we, if we were invested in our children that way instead of people that are coming in and misbehaving on our streets. And, and Tanya, Tanya, I respectfully disagree with you too and if I'm coming off hot, I, I am hot, I apologize. It's nothing to do with you or us or anybody on this board here. I've been dealing with this for 
in this role for 10 years I've been here. I've had addiction in my life my entire life. I've buried multiple people with needles in their arms. So, yes, I'm hot about this issue. Thank you. And if, and if, and if I'm disrespectful to you or anybody on this panel, I, I apologize. I don't mean to be like that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Baker. I am going to continue with questions from the uh, other, I want to give time to my other colleagues. So we're going to, but if, if on another round you want to also answer Councillor Baker's question, you can. Uh, I'm going in order of arrival. Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you to the advocates and the panelists who are here um, this morning. Um, let me just start by saying that, um, like a Chief um, Mariama Whitehammond, you know, I survived the war on drugs while my friends fell victim to it, right? So this conversation is not one of those that, um, for me, are political, because these things are really personal to a lot of us, right? As Councilor Baker just mentioned. So there is a lot of passion around this issue. Um, you know, and I started my career in harm reduction, as you mentioned, Chief Mariama White Hammond, focused with, uh, on HIV prevention um, and working and engaging sex workers on how to take care of themselves while they were out in the streets in the Orchard Garden area. That was in the 90s, right? And here we are, decades later, still having the same conversation, but it's different actors who are now leading what we're trying to grapple with. And I also just want to make note that this has been, um, I first came to learn about Needles in the Park through uh, Leon Rivera, who was a fierce advocate, um, posting a lot of things on Facebook eight, almost eight to 10 years ago. And we're still having this conversation. So there is something to be said about the lack of urgency in, in, in certain times to really grapple with this issue. But I think it's because we haven't really devoted um, the time and the resources to get it right. And I also believe that when I think about the Attorney General's office, when I think about the state, you know, our state representatives, um, they should be involved in this conversation too, because it's everybody plays a role in what we're dealing with. And so, um, through the chair and to the co to the sponsors of this hearing, you know, when we start thinking about this, we'd love to have more folks who who can help ground us and 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 kind of where we go from here. I do have some questions. Trust me. Um, I I have a 12 year old daughter who um, is a member of the base and um, uses Clifford Park for her practice um, in that field. And when she goes to play, I always worry about her and her, um, her, and her um, colleagues. And so we have to do something, right? And it's not just about my kids, it's all, it's all of our kids. Um, so, here's some questions. Um, you mentioned that various departments are working together, um, and I'm just curious, uh, can you just talk to us a little bit about some of the coordination efforts? Are you meeting regularly? Kind of what the outcomes are of those meetings? What are some of the goals and objectives that you put forth for yourself in terms of issues that arise, and how are you dealing with those issues? Right, because I always say that Boston is resource rich but coordination poor, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about your coordination efforts. That's one question. Um, I, I didn't hear BPS as part of one of the departments or folks that are at the table, but they're very much impacted by this issue, so I'm just curious what role BPS is playing and how the families um, within the surrounding community are, are helping to inform some of that work. I'd like to learn what, if anything, you have learned from other cities that are grappling with this issue in terms of best practices that you think Boston is well suited to, um, to adopt. Uh, and I believe, um, Captain, you had mentioned um, 
some work around public safety. Uh, uh, can you just kind of walk us through a little bit more kind of what that looks like? Um, you know, how many people are out there? You said that some folks, that you have some folks who are parked um, and that are visually uh, noticeable that they're there for that work, but you said there were other individuals. So I'm just curious who those other individuals are, what role do they play, and how are they helping um, to address some of these issues? I, I just would like a better understanding of what that looks like. Um, and then I'm just curious, you had mentioned um, you have eight, poli eight patrol officers, right, Monday through Friday um, until 11.45, but I'm curious about what happens after 11.45. Um, I'm curious about what happens between that time frame and what, uh, what is put in, in place for, for that 11.45 after, because I think there's a gap there. Um, so if you can provide some clarity around that, that would be helpful. Um, and I know I ask a lot of questions. I'm hoping that you all can get to them. And I will just end with shutting up and waiting for my next round of questions so that I don't take up any more space. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. And we'll have another round in case there are more questions. Uh, who would like to start? I can. I can. Mr. Rio, you have the floor. Yes, I can start. Um, no, and I just wanted to make a comment on the fact that I do, having interacted with kind of people from all different perspectives about this issue, I do truly believe that we are all coming from a place of personal concern for the situation. And um, even though we have real disagreements about how to solve this issue, what the policy may be, I do believe that people have a personal concern for the well-being of their community. So um, again, like I thank every community member, city councilor, colleague that's a part of this because I, I truly believe that. I, okay, I want to just go through the budget for each site if that's something that is helpful or just maybe the ones that were named. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, w the total cost for the low threshold housing for the year, and that includes the build out costs for the new sites that were stood up, um, including for the roundhouse that was $2.5 million, which obviously is not is a, is a one time. The total cost for fiscal year 23 was $24 million for the six sites. Mm -hmm. Uh, $29 million, if you include the clinic at the roundhouse, that serves many more people than the people who are just staying there. People that are staying on the street use those services all the time to help um, stabilize themselves. And um, so that's the number. As far as the coordinated efforts, it's intense, Councillor. We do have 12 city departments that are members of the coordinated response team that are on a daily call every single morning at 8.45 to all be aware of the, that day's situation. That includes the public, Department of Public Works, Public Health Commission, Mayor's Office, Public Schools, Parks, Streets, Recovery Services, Boston Police Department. Uh, we've even collaborated um, here and there with the Boston Water Sewer Commission to clear out the drains on the street, et cetera. Um, it actually goes way beyond just the 12 city departments. Um, as others have shared, we do co collaborate with outside organizations that are key to the work there. Um, I'll start with New Market Bid, but Pine Street Inn is helping us cover overnight um, outreach efforts citywide. Boston Healthcare, Healthcare for the Homeless program, uh, responding to emergency overdoses, providing case uh, management services, you name it, they're on the street with us. Uh, where security, New England security, Boston Medical Center, I could, I could go on with this list. Um, we also have a weekly call that involves even more departments internally. I'm sorry. Um, and I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just want to make sure that the question that I asked specifically yes. was I'd like, I, I, I appreciate knowing who is there, but I really want to get into outcomes right, kind of deliverables, what happens in those yeah. conversations. What are some of the metrics that you're using to inform your response? And where, are you, where do you believe you might be falling short so that we have a better understanding of where are some of the resources that we need to lean in more into? That's kind of what I want to get into. If you could talk about some deliverables, that would be helpful. Yeah, definitely. So those are, essentially you could see what our deliverables are. If you look at our dashboard on the website, each tab is one of the, one of the pillars of our, I guess, response or metrics that we're looking at. So I'll start with daily operations. That's just very simple 
how many people here are here present on the street with no other place to go. So you can follow that on our daily operations. On those calls, we not only talk about that number, but we talk about um, any instances of crime, any instances of public threats to everybody's public safety. Um, we're looking at 311 cases, um, looking at how that caseload and how our response time goes for anything from human waste to um, encampments that are forming citywide uh, where we need to engage with people and provide outreach. We're looking at syringe data to see are we picking up more needles than we're giving out, um, how is our public health, um, you know, our outcomes regarding to public health. Same with EMS, we're looking at treatment data, obviously. We wanna know, our, the vision obviously is that every person that needs treatment can get it in a timely manner and doesn't feel like there's not a resource there for them to grab onto, and the same with housing. So all of those, those are the metrics that we're looking at, um, and not only we're looking at them, we want the public to look at them with us so that we, are, we can hold ourselves accountable. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it with that. I'll add to the vision. It's not uh, kind of a metric reflected here, but we do want a park and a public way in a community that is safe and healthy for everyone, every community member, and that's, um, that's all, obviously the most important part of the vision. Thank you, Ms. Orio. <laughs> Lieutenant Messina, would you like to answer a little bit more about Councillor Mejia's questions yes, of the patrols? Sorry, am I on? Yes, sir. Um, so we only have a, a, a day tour and an evening tour. Uh, on the overnight uh, response at Clifford Park is coordinated with Captain Cogman in District B2, uh, who sends a car down there at 6.30 in the morning, and, and based on staffing, it's some points during the night. Uh, but it's all staffing based and, and what's going on in, in their district. I could, I could touch on that a little bit more, and, and I, I can get to the point, too, of some of the other units that are available and what mm -hmm. they're doing. And, um, so, so District B2 is, is a regular police station. We're structured in a manner that if someone calls 911, it's going to be our police officers from B2 that responds to that call. We have police officers assigned to the Mass and Cass area, which is, is uh, the B2 side is, I always say it's Clifford Park, but it's also the crosswalks at Mass Ave into the neighborhood. So if it's a Mass Ave address, it's a different police district. Um, so. Anything in the neighborhoods there up to Dudley Street is B2. Okay. Um, so that will, will be there. So we're down, we have police officers in the area of Clifford Park and um, Island and Gerard 24-7, 365 days a year, with the exception of uh, uh, occasionally when maybe the marathon and staffing restricts us. So there are a few instances where you may not see during significant events, the election coming up, we may not have offices available. Um, so there are some, some staffing constraints. Um, so that's what we do, and we help out with um, the street outreach when, when they um, finish at 11.45 at night. Um, our officers are down there, and they're available to take radio calls and keep an eye on what's going on in the area. Um, I mentioned the human trafficking unit. Um, I can't stay, say how many people specifically are in the, those units. They're, they're not under my command, but I will say they have several detectives from the Boston Police assigned to them. I know they have some Mass State Troopers there, and they also have some um, police officers from outside of the city, from other local police departments that are a part of it. It's a task force, and um, they operate a lot in Boston, but they're not exclusive to Boston, so they may be somewhere else on um, you know different days. But they do spend, um, I would say, a considerable amount of time um, down Mass and Cass and in the city because there's some other spots that we have some issues with. And they, they will do um, investigations and they'll do street level prostitution um, investigations, whether it's the uh, person on the street or the, the buyer. Um, they also have um, some clinicians with them, so they have the ability to um, make arrests and summons perpetrators, they also have the uh, opportunity and availability to provide counseling and uh, treatment for some of the people that are involved in that, and that's part of the task force. It's all together, it's a package. So um, when the street, I'm sorry, when the human trafficking unit is around, they have those resources readily available to try to see if someone needs help, and sometimes they don't need help, sometimes they do need to be arrested, and then they do get arrested. And I think if you look, or you remember in the paper, there have been some uh, front page Herald articles about some of the arrests that they've made down there. Um, so they've, they've proven very valuable. Um, as far as like when they're scheduled and when they're around, I would rather not say. I think it's better that people think they're there all the time. 
Um, and, and that's what they do. They, uh, they do have flexibility to, to change to times and conditions and complaints. Um, and, and obviously there's certain times of the day that are better and certain times of the day that aren't. And um, they, they know that the human trafficking unit knows that and they prioritize their time and their efforts. Um, I also mentioned that the drug control unit, what we call the DCU. We have offices assigned to B2 that work for the drug control unit. So they actually work for a different um, division, which is the drug control unit, but there's a group of people assigned to B2 to, to kind of deal with B2's issues and complaints and concerns. Um, so, I'm sorry? Yeah, no, I, was, I was waiting, I, I do, ha I was gonna have a follow up, but I wanted Beautiful. to get Captain, let me know when you're finished and then yeah. I'll give okay. Councilor May have the floor so she can ask her follow up. Yep, I just touched on the other ones too. So, so um, um, the, the drug control unit will, they'll do anything from, B2's down there quite a bit. The benefit of the location of Mass and Cass from a policing standpoint is that's actually the intersection of three police districts. Mm -hmm. So uh, although we have our district uh, B2 drug control unit available for our area, Mass Ave, which is C6, has a squad also. And then on the other side by the BMC, which is District 4, there's another squad over there. So there's three different um, districts in that area um, that have drug control units, and then we also have a couple citywide units. So the effort from the drug control unit down in that area is basically every single day, and again, I don't want to get into times, but it's every single day there's something going on, on the, with the drug unit in that area. They, um, again, they do street level, what we would call rips, by someone buys it, they arrest, they summons, um, and they also do investigations where they may lead to something else, which is difficult for us to like nail down and say, oh, we got drug dealer X, and that was a mass and cast person, because the reality is it might be an investigation, it might be com someone coming from Lowell to sell drugs down there, mm -hmm. and you, I can't say to you that that's a result of that, uh, you know, of something at Mass and Cast, but that's the stuff that's happening with the drug unit. It splinters off into better investigations, and, and again, I think that goes back to one of the things we would rather. Um, some of the people we're dealing down there, particularly when they're involved in drugs, um, have serious health concerns, so as a, a district commander, um, as a police officer and as a human being, sometimes putting a sick person in a cell block uh, because they've been arrested is not the best way to go. And um, getting them either to the hospital or help might be better. So sometimes we will summons people, um, which is, uh, uh, avails us of the opportunity to get someone health care and uh, have them not be sick in the police station. Uh, we, we want to avoid that at all costs. Um, then we have the, uh, the bike unit, which is down there, they're down there quite a bit. Um, they, they provide a lot of visibility and the, the, a police presence. Um, you'll see them uh, pedaling around down there. And uh, I think the visibility is helpful. And then, um, I had one more. Oh, and then the Youth Violence Strike Force, which is also known as the gang unit. The, w what their role is, um, again, they usually play in clothes, but I think we, know, we, we would know them when we saw them. But the, um, they have the avail uh, uh, ability to identify what we would call some of maybe the more impact players. They're not necessarily the individuals that are down there just using drugs or people that have, these are people that are coming down there perhaps selling drugs or have the ability to be violent um, and that are a concern to them. And the, and the Youth Violence Strike Force tends to know some of the people that might be more violent and, uh, and they're down there. There was a um, shots fired um, on Pompey Street a couple weeks ago. We were fortunate we got some very good uh, video and um, we got video at night, it was about four in the morning, and we got more video at about 10 in the morning, and then uh, B2 and the Youth Violence Strike Force and the detectives went down in the morning and caught a person with a pistol. So these are um, options in other units that we're utilizing. Again, you, do you see them all the time? Nope, you're not, and you're not gonna. If, if, if you're seeing the drug unit, we're doing something wrong. But, um, th but they are down there, and um, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Captain. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor for your follow-up question, and Thank then you. we're going to move on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, and I'll reserve the other two questions that I had for my round two, but I just want to do a follow-up now. Yes. Um, you know, there seems to be a disconnect with what I'm hearing here and what I'm hearing out in these streets in terms of just response rate for some of the activity that has brought us all in here for, for today's discussion, um, and that is around the 
open drug market. That's what I've been hearing. Um, it doesn't seem, or at least if there's a dashboard or if there's a place for accountability where we can actually see that return on the investment of like kind of what is happening to kind of get a handle on the drug uh, uh, sales, if you will. I, I just feel like there is, if, if you can point us to a place where we can um, see the outcomes, if it, if it exists, like arrest, number of arrests, you know, like anything to that nature. Just because what we hear in the community is that there is nothing, right? There is no presence, there is no reaction, there is no return on any of those investments. And I think this is an opportunity since we're here in a public hearing to really be able to say, well, actually, that is not the case. Here are the date. Here's the here are the numbers. Here's what we've been able to do, et cetera. Just so that everybody is on the same page. I can, Lieutenant, just, you have the floor. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, just uh, was last week, I believe it was, or begin. No, I'm sorry, Tuesday evening. I, I briefed those statistics on the uh, the Lower Roxbury uh, South End Working Group. Uh, yes. Yep. Um, and and arrests are up year to date. Overall arrests are up 81 uh, percent. Um, we have well over 300 uh, drug incidents, I believe, off the top of my head, uh, and summonses and arrests are, are pretty even down, down the middle. Um, ideally, for a lot of the, the users out there, the Boston Police Department is looking to get them treatment. Um, that's, that's the goal. Uh, and the drug traffickers out there are, are getting arrested. Um, so we are doing the best we can out there. I mean, 81% is, is, is a is a large number for us. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you. And thank you, Councilor Mejia, for your questions. Council President Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to the sponsors of this important hearing. Thank you to the panel for being here, for the work you're doing, and especially I want to say thank you to the residents of the, of the community in and around Clifford Park. I had the opportunity to be a probation officer before this job at, at Suffolk Superior Court for, for nine years. And I had to put, unfortunately, I had to put a lot of recommend to the judge to send a lot of people to um, to detox or to Bridgewater. Um, most of them didn't want to go, some did. Um, but people using drugs and involved in, in crime in Boston, <clears throat> this, being on the street is probably the worst, place, the worst place for them. I want to acknowledge the important work that Boston police do every day and every night I don't think, in my opinion, we have enough Boston police officers in this city. It's obvious from, from the conversations here that, you know, w one thing I notice is we want Clifford Park to be clean for our children so that they, they can play sports. And, you know, but we don't want, we don't want to arrest anybody. And we don't want to arrest any um, low-level person that's making, uh, that's, that's involved in some type of um, <clears throat> quality of life issue um, or someone using drugs. And I, I agree with the captain. I don't, I don't think the jail cell is the place for someone that's arrested. And then the police captain being responsible for them, especially on a weekend if there's no, if there's no medical care. But I guess my point is, we want to. We want pox, but we don't want to make, as a society, the tough choices that go along with with the safe pox. If you're involved in any type of drug activity, you don't belong in a pox. Pox are about recreation. Pox are about sports. They're about football. They're about baseball. They're about elderly people walking and getting exercise. It's about people jogging for mental health and. In, in talking, it's not about it's not about using drugs. Um, we we heard here that there's hundreds and hundreds of opportunities for anyone that needs drug treatment to get drug treatment. 
almost, almost immediately. And clearly the people at Clifford Park are not there yet. But that doesn't mean that the residents and the young people should suffer for it. If, they, if people don't want to get into drug treatment program, I guess that's their choice. But being in a park and being disruptive is a, is a quality of life issue. And as a city, we should not, we should not allow that. We have three district councilors that are here. Well, four district councilors that are here, and three of them represent the area in and around Mass and Cass. Myself, Councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Baker. The captain mentioned some of the police districts in and around Mass, Mass Ave, including C6 and, and District 4, with Captain Sweeney and, and Captain Boyle. But we're also asking police officers. We're asking police officers to work 16-hour days in and around some of this environment uh, without, a, without a day off. And then we get frustrated at the police for not, for not making arrests. But then, but then we, we, we don't want people arrested because we don't want to arrest our way out of problems either. So as a society, we still have to be more consistent about this and work with the community, work with the police, work, work with our city officials that are here, get people into treatment. That's the number one priority. But if, the, if their priority is not getting into treatment, they do not belong in a park. A park is about football, it's about baseball, it's about basketball, it's tennis, it's, it's walking, it's jogging. It's not about drug use. I also am involved in sports with my son down at Moakley Park, which is not far from Clifford Park. It's probably, it's probably a half a mile, I guess. Um, we also, not, not to the extent that Clifford Park has, but we also have similar challenges as, as, other, as other parks do as well. Um, but as a city, as a community, it's about quality of life for the residents. It's about public safety. We are a compassionate city, but that compassion should not be used as ex an excuse not to deal with issues at our public parks. Um, I don't necessarily have any questions, um, but m maybe some of the answer is also, as Councilor Baker is, is working with the Sheriff's Department, working with the District Attorney's Office. When I was the probation officer, I, had eight, I, I supervised the homeless community. If I had 80 people on probation at one time, 60 of them may, committed their offense outside of Suffolk County. They committed their offense in Middlesex County, or Barnstable County, or Dukes County, or Hamden County, uh, Franklin County. Basically, those areas of the city, areas of the state rather, um, basically sent these guys, mostly guys, to Boston, because Boston has services. And so where do you go? You end up at Mass, Mass and Cass, and you, and you try to get some services there. Um, but cities and towns across Massachusetts have failed uh, the residents of Boston. We're being penalized, we're being punished for being a compassionate city, in my opinion. Uh, we, just can't, we just can't have that same type of commitment to everybody that comes into Boston, unfortunately. I think also the, the court system needs to be at these meetings as well. Uh, the district attorney needs to be at these community, these hearings as well. And there has to be a role for the courts to play in uh, this discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the sponsors. Thank you to the panelists for the important work you are doing. Thank you to the community. And also thank you, um, especially in my opinion, really to the to the Boston police that are out there every day and every night, and we expect so much from them, and um, and then we and then unfortunately we don't we don't support them, we we, we second guess them. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, President Flynn. Councillor Luigian, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you so much to all the panelists for being here and for your dedication to this issue. I think um, Tanya said it. You know, folks. Even if we have different approaches, everyone is looking for a solution. No one wants this to be 
happening in our city. And so I also want to thank um, those who've offered public testimony because, frankly, it's just unfair that you are bearing the burden of a citywide, regional, um, and statewide issue. Um, it is unfair. Um, and we have to find a solution um, that I, I believe the captain mentioned is, is not about arresting our way out of it, but finding a way to, to, to healing for a lot of the folks who are down there. Um, I think someone mentioned that re at, the, at the root of this is we have a mental health crisis. And what's unfortunate is that we don't have a health care system. We have a system that is a sick care system. You go there if you're sick. And so many of our systems are reactionary. They're reacting to our problem rather than being proactive and getting in front of it. And I, and I, one of those areas is around making sure that folks have housing. So when Tanya, when you were talking about the numbers of people moving into, um, uh, people moving into permanent housing, um, why doesn't that, it looks like we're getting folks off of mass and casts into either the roundhouse or another uh, low threshold housing option, and then folks are going into permanent housing. Why aren't those numbers of people moving onward? Why isn't that reflected in what people see every day at mass and casts? Thank you, Councillor. It's, it's as you said, we have a public health, a mental health crisis, and we have a substance use disorder epidemic. And so as we place people into housing, there's always new people go, coming into the throes of active addiction. I agree with what's been said as far as the park or the street. It's not a dignified, it's not of an appropriate place for people to stabilize, to take a step into treatment and recovery, that's, that's not the right um, situation for them to get stable in that way. That's why um, I, I wanted to share those, those results from the low threshold housing because as people stabilize, they have a moment to breathe, they have a moment to think about, well, well yes, I want to go into treatment, yes, I want to eventually uh, mm -hmm. get into stable housing, see my family again, and, and when you do get to see those stories, it's wonderfully inspirational. Um, so on that, we agree, we, we, we see the negative effects on the people who are experiencing this, and also on the community for, for having them on the street or, or, or in parks, and um, we are aligned in thinking that there's got to be a better way. Um, Ms. Del Rio, there was a question from Councillor Lee Jen specifically about why you think that what people are experiencing day to day is not being reflective in the numbers that you shared with us. Can you please answer that? Maybe to, to, yeah, to state it a little okay. more simply. When it becomes solid is when you can speak. Yeah. No, no, you were right. Yeah, don't touch it. Trust it. Sorry. To state it more simply, as people are entering and being referred into treatment or housing every single day, but we do see new faces coming to the street every single day as well. That's a dynamic. Could I add something quickly? Absolutely. Um, I think I'm really thankful. I, I want to name that I've been praying about this hearing since yesterday, because I was deeply concerned it was going to go in a very poor direction. Um, but as I've been listening, I. I hear something that reminded me, I, I think that some of you know I used to run a youth organization called Project Hip Hop, and every summer we'd study what community organizing is, and we'd have an exercise, sometimes we just read it, but sometimes we actually get to act it out. And, and the story was of a village where there was a, water, a river in the middle and that people would use to wash, to get water, et cetera. And one day a baby comes down in a basket and they discover the baby. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, where's this baby from? Oh, but, and there was an older couple who at the time was, was childless and they decided to take in the baby. So at first it seemed like a blessing, but then the next day another baby came down the river. And then the day after. And by the time it had been a few months in, this small village had 30 new babies. And it moved from seeing those babies as a blessing to getting into major arguments about the child care support that they had. It was beyond what they could handle. And we'd always put this problem out to the young people and people would get into these whole debates. 
And sometimes, sometimes the staff had to do it, sometimes one young person would ask, where are the babies coming from? And I, I feel at times that like the dynamic is we are fighting over the ability to handle a situation, and we should. We have to put the resources there. But we also need to ask a question about why these people are showing up in our community. And I think that lots of work is happening. People are doing amazing work, and the problem is still growing. I spoke on the phone to the mayor the other night, because now it's not just Clifford Park, it's also Franklin Park. And we're trying to figure out which interventions can we use from Clifford Park. Tanya's already sent me a letter. We're trying to figure out where we can add lighting. And I, I want us to respond. But I'm not sure that we will ever have enough resources to respond to this problem as it grows if at some point we also don't ask, what is the root cause of this and what can we do about it? And from my perspective, there, I hear three themes in what people are saying that I just want to suggest we have a conversation about not in a hearing. Much love to the hearing. It's not the appropriate environment and construct. But one is that some of these people are our, our family. And the truth is, from my perspective, I see both the dealers and the addicted people because I got people in my family on both sides of that. They're our family. And the question is, what is the balance between public health and public safety? And what is the most appropriate way to help people most quickly get to the point where they're ready to shift before they die? And I know a number of us have prayed at nights for people we believe will not make it if something doesn't happen. So I think that's a really nuanced conversation. And I hear it come up in every community meeting, but not in a deeply spiritual, interconnected way that can help us move forward. So I, I would love to suggest that we need to just have one meeting that's only about that. The second thing I'm hearing, and I want to just throw this out, what bold solutions are we willing to try? Like, I want to have a conversation about safe injection. I'm a clergy person, and I know that usually we are against that kind of conversation, but we got to have a conversation about where we are willing to push the envelope and try something new because I don't think we're gonna get there on our own. And then the last thing is, we cannot make progress if other cities and towns in the state are not willing to do their part. And I feel sometimes we are so turned in on each other, arguing about how we address this, that we are not united in our push on some of the other communities that in some instances are putting their people on the train and telling them go to Boston, that's where the resources are. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a whole nother conversation. So I just wanna suggest, I'm so willing to talk about this, and I think a lot of us have been to a number of community meetings and not a ton of this is totally new to us. And I, I hope that we might find an, another time and another space to have these deeper conversations and figure out how we take some specific action steps around them. Thank you, Chief White Hammond. Councilor Lujan, you still have the floor if you have any more questions. Thank you, um, and thank you, Chief White Hammond. Um, if this wasn't, you know, my question to Tanya was a, as a, was a bit of a leading question about we're seeing more people in part and it's gonna, it's gonna be a, a hard word to use, but in part because of the success a bit of transitioning folks and folks coming to Mass and Cast, and, and in part because they know that there's a solution, it's unclear what that really is, but folks are, there are more folks coming in as we succeed in moving people onward towards uh, uh, whether low threshold housing and then permanent housing. And, and it's a success that you can't see because more people keep on coming because, and they're not, and they're coming from both within Boston but also outside of Boston because this is a regional and a statewide issue. And so I just wanted to shine a light a little bit on that, that part of that solution, right, as you were talking about the, what are the root causes and 
having stable shelter is part of that. And so I think it's an important thing to say like, yes, it's really expensive because housing has been commodified in a way that um, makes it expensive to ensure housing as a human right, but we're doing it and making small steps and that's important. And the failure of other cities um, to respond similarly um, is a problem. So I think uh, the next question is, what are those regional conversations that we've been having? Have we been having them with other cities that are not investing in finding solutions? You know, we're here and we're pointing out the crisis, but we are also taking steps to, you know, solutions that we know or like Reverend uh, Chief uh, White Hammond stated uh, to, to exploring what else is possible. So are we having those regional conversations? What are they like? Where is the state in helping, uh, in helping us out here? A comment on the, on the first point that you made and then I'll answer the question if that's okay. Um, in my very short, admittedly very short experience, I just want to um, make a, maybe a, a comment about nuance here. Most people I have spoken to are not necessarily coming here because they've heard there's resources and housing, which there are, and that is the reason people do stay because um, at the end of the day, the harm reduction services that we are providing do help keep people alive. So if you look at the numbers, we do see more overdose deaths in private homes outside of the Mass and Cass area. That is because of the life-saving harm reduction services that um, Jen's team is providing. Um, but what's really, in my experience, talking with people, what's really bringing them to the area is a sense of community, a sense of here is a place where uh, other people will not see me as less than and, and less than human. And um, I think that we should just uh, continue, you know, I don't think that we should, we should say, oh, because we're providing life-saving service, life services, people are humming, coming, so we should stop. That's kind of the point mm -hmm. I wanted to make. And then the question about the regional conversation. That is a formal part of the administration's medium and long-term plan. We are tremendously excited and have been in conversations with state government. I mean, they were key in setting up a couple of these low threshold sites. I have to say that we need to ramp that up significantly. That is going to be on me, and um, there's a lot of work to be done. We're not, yeah, we're not where we need to be on that yet, but, but point taken, and, and yes, it's part of our plan. It's been a bandwidth issue, quite honestly. Yep. Two uh, more follow-up questions, and I think that what you're talking about, the sense of community, and I mean, I think it's been mentioned here before, like when we all recently took a trip there, but Long Island is definitely a part of this solution, and we can't um, get it going soon enough, soon enough uh, to really be part of the solution. The second question is just zoning it back in on Clifford Park. We also, a few weeks ago, a bunch of us went to Clifford Park, and at the end of it, and I know that your team has been working really hard to have stationary cleanups, um, and at the end of it, my team went back to the park because that's where our cars were parked and we had to deal with a situation with someone who had needles and was, you know, uh, being, um, was potentially unresponsive. And I think that part of what folks want to see is that we have this stationary cleanup and we've been, thanks to the new market bid, thanks to the efforts of Councilor Baker and other people, how can we continue to improve the cleanup process at Clifford Park? Build on the success or, you know, and the failures from, from this, the new stationary cleanup that we have. Yeah, I, I, we are open to ideas. I'll just restate what we currently have going on and Again, yeah, open to ideas. So we do have the recovery services team canvassing that neighborhood three, and, and prioritizing Clipper, Clifford Park. They're there by 6.30 a.m. and present three times a day. The city's mobile sharps team is responding to yeah. the m one seven. I don't think we need, I, I, I just, market. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned all that. I just wanted to see like now, like, and maybe it's a conversation for another time, but we have that and I think that was responsive to what a lot of people wanted and we're still seeing that that's not enough. So just in terms of the conversation, in terms of like how we can do a better job, um, we just the, continuing to think about what that is. Um, and maybe it's more permanence of cleanup, you know, of, of the staff rather than shifting them in and out. Maybe that's a potential solution. And then lastly is that you mentioned, uh, Captain, you mentioned the, the 
the three different police uh, stations that are involved in the area, but didn't mention that state police are also involved. And that's another way of having a regional response or approach. So can you talk about what the state police do in the area and how you work together and what uh, on the issue, and not really just about Clifford Park, but really about the area in general? Yes, ma'am. Um, so we are in contact with the state police. They have a homeless outreach team. Uh, state police have limited jurisdiction uh, in the area. Their jurisdiction encompasses uh, basically Melnia Cass. Uh, but we are in communication with them. We work with them. I, I speak with them roughly once a week. Uh, they have a good team, and, and we do collaborate on a, on a multitude of different issues, not only in the Mass and Cass area, but citywide. So what, are, what do they actually, if you could walk us through, like, what, what do what are the state police actually do? Like, what do they do when they're there? You really have to ask the state police that question. Now, we do speak with them. We do collaborate with them on different individuals there and different problems in the area that fall into their jurisdiction. Uh, but you really have to ask the state police exactly their role as to what they do. Okay. Well, I just, you know, if we, if we are having a regional approach to this, understanding what they're doing, I think, is, is, is part of, like, an, a regional yeah, I mean, response. It, you are correct. It is part of a regional response. Uh, the main thing is they do have a homeless outreach team. Uh, I do know of the homeless outreach team. I have worked with them in the past, and they do the same things my outreach, outreach team does. I mean, diversion to treatment, that's the main thing. Uh, and collaboration on different individuals that are in the area. Uh, most of the individuals that they deal with, we deal with. So that, that constant communication and collaboration is key. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I look forward to when we are having these regional conversations that if there are regional partners that are present there physically, that they be brought in because it also is a question of is this an efficient use of resources? And so if we don't know what folks are doing and are unaware of the efficacy of what they're doing, then we have to rethink how we're using our resources. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Luijen. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think it's uh, important that we always speak in context of, you know, um, historical context and as well as like personal perspective. Um, and for myself, and I think, and obviously we are hearing a lot here that many people share experiences and personal connections to the issue. Um, so I'll just speak from a personal perspective. Um, so I, I and, and many of you already know that I come from a very um, poor, um, extreme, extreme poverty in West Africa, Cape Verde, and to the projects here uh, in the 90s and living through, or as my colleague, um, Council Mejia mentioned, um, surviving the crack epidemic. Um, living in the projects, I can count at least eight friends that I know got killed by execution style, bodies fell on me, witnessed one, found a body in, in, in the catwalk, in academies. Um, and then you just find people drugged out, um, living in academies. You find people knocking on your doors. Um, the feces, the sexual acts, uh, prostitution, being solicited for, cops soliciting me for sex. Uh, yeah, you go through it all. Like as a teen coming home, working two jobs, trying to pay the bills. Um, we, we went through that in the 90s, and if you had a poor family, if you were immigrant or non, you lived in the projects and you saw this stuff. So when I hear um, Ms. Marla testify uh, and, talk, and speak to the concentration of poverty and resources in black neighborhoods, and then for it to be historically disenfranchised and now to lead to today, I'll speak a little bit about my work context, um, my experience, and then I'll lead to my questions. Um, I thank you so much for your perspective, um, Ms. Marla. I, I've followed you on social media, but have never actually had a full conversation with you. Um, really appreciate it in the way that you put it together today. Um, and I'll say that in uh, harm reduction or any type of um, uh, uh, CSP or uh, community support programs or any type of needle exchange, uh, programs, or um, I was a HIV testing counselor, so that came with needle exchange. We worked in a combat zone. We worked Blue Halav. We, um, we worked uh, from Dimmick Street. We would be sent to, um, is it a community? Well, they would call it Women uh, Connected Affecting Change, but it was a code for uh, Sex Industry Workers Center. Um, and folks would come in and, you know, with no judgment, they could just sit 
um, and they could bathe and they could take a rest and they were Reiki and all this type of really holistic good stuff. The program is no longer there. Um, haven't done my research to understand if there was a replacement or alter alternative. And then you have folks that evidence-based research that shows that th there are alternatives to summoning people to court. Um, people are calling it here Section 35. But I think maybe if we do away with uh, labels of policies or failed policies that we believe does not, um, or that we believe criminalizes uh, addiction, then perhaps we can uh, create some sort of uh, collaborative effort to discuss alternative to Section 35 in a way that's um, evidence-based but also harm-reducing. The issue with our um, society today, I think that um, especially Western medicine, it's usually react reactive and um, mostly uh, tr treatable, uh, but not preventative. And so we, we look at preventative measures in public health in two ways. Either you are investing in social determinants of health to actually curve this issue from the beginning right, uh, to Councillor Baker's points about investing in our youth, investing in services, um, and then also to um, support quality of life in communities of color, as Ms. Marlowe was saying, um, not, and, and also, of course, uh, providing safety measures to our residents. Um, and so I mentioned in a, in a press conference uh, recently that Dr. G. McGuire is actually a mentor to my mom. My mom worked for MECO with her for over 30, over 20, about 20 years. I used to swim with Ms. G. McGuire. She would outrun me in the parks. Um, and um, this is a very close friend and like a mother to, to us all. Um, and so we look at all of these harms and we're hurt. Um, and we look at people like uh, Domingos uh, De Rosa, Jahida Lopez, uh, Leon Rivera, Miss Marla, um, Desi, and Andrew, and all these other people that have come together. And I've showed up to South End forums. I've talked to you. I've listened to you. Um, and we're all uh, emotionally um, compromised. And so we want something to happen. And then when we have these different institutions that are trying and putting out efforts, our response is to always to find the root of the problem. This is a natural order of, how, of human conduct. And so what we do is we naturally say, um, whose fault is it? Where's the baby coming from? And or why is the baby coming? And so my question also is, if there were babies already here, though, can we look at some of uh, reparatory truth and reconciliation processes in the communities that addresses the fact that the crack epidemic was severely ignored. And then can we also address the groups of advocates and um, uh, people that are fighting for community as yourselves, can we address them and bring them to conversations um, and not exclude them? Um, and then we talk about, in terms of our qualifications, we must be honest. Honestly, in all the conversations that we've had with community advocates, with people in recovery, with ourselves, no one here is qualified. Not the mayor. She doesn't have the answer. I don't have the answer. The police doesn't have the answer. Parks doesn't have the answer. Public health doesn't have the answer. The victims don't have the answer. The council, does anybody here have the answer? No one, no one, absolutely. You have an idea. You have opinions, you have suggestions. So then where do we go from there? Can we figure out how, and I hear the police officers, uh, the captain, um, lieutenant, is it, sorry, um, speak about the work and your job is to be out there, and I agree with Council Flynn, they are inundated with overtime and all of this work. Um, and if, you, if I speak to your work, and I thank you for your service, but if I speak to your work that I'm coddling and sympathizing with police, it's such a divisive society. If I thank you right now for the parks cleaning, oh my God, that's because that's her friend. If I say, Tanya, it's not your fault, you just got here, in fact, your experience with this is limited. 
oh my God, she's sympathizing with Tanya, that's it. We're such a divisive society that instead of us being honest about, you just don't know what the heck we're talking about. And let's create the platform that we can actually bring the policies that's worked. If Lisbon, Portugal's practices with Section 35 does not, it cannot be implement, duplicated exactly protocol per protocol, let's amend that. Let's discuss how we can actually use that plan here. I can talk about metrics, and I had questions. At first I was writing away questions about metrics, about dashboard, exactly what are your numbers, um, and I have, oh my God, you see my pages? And then I said, it doesn't matter because at this point, we all know what we know, and I'm interested in how are we coming together, to Council Lugen's point, how is the state and local police working together? Is there some sort of policy in place? And if there isn't, our job as a legislative body is to support you in that, to be able to put something in place so that it can happen. Um, I think that I will reserve my questions through the chair by email. I have a whole list of cleaning, the numbers, addressing. I worked in this field. I know a lot about this population. Um, and so I won't waste your time in getting all of these um, numbers together. But I'm highly interested in getting together with you, Domingos, uh, Marla, all of the community folks, Tanya, of course, and the police, and the DA's office. Um, I think bringing together medical professionals as well, they have a, a strong uh, pharmaceutical investment in this. Um, and looking at what does that round table, what does that triage of um, summoning someone to court, what does that panel look like so that we can begin to address these issues. I don't want to blame the victim and say, you know, oh, well, you know, you locked away my black men all this time and now, all of a sudden, it's a disease. Again, shaming the victim is not the answer. Shaming each other is certainly not the answer. And if we're unqualified, let's call that out, and let's work together to come to a solution, God willing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez-Anderson. Um, so I will, I will make my comments, and I will keep them brief so that we can move on to the last part of public testimony and then do one last round of questions. Um, I ask my council colleagues that if you have one last question, please, it's about 1220. I want to make sure that people can testify. So if there's like one last question, we'll do a final round of questions um, and then let the, the panel close us out. Um, similarly to everybody here, this is not an, an issue that is unfamiliar to me. I was actually working at the Boston Public Health Commission when the decision came down that they were going to close the Long Island Bridge. And you could feel the tension. You could cut it with a knife in the entire building. We saw the opioid epidemic coming. Everybody in that building knew that it was a bad decision to close Long Island. And you felt it all the way from every single one of the bureaus to the executive office. I was 21. We're talking 12 years that it took to this, to, to the, for this issue to reach this fever pitch. When I was 22 years old, my best friend Michael died of a heroin overdose. Again, we saw the opioid epidemic coming, all of us. This is an issue that took over a decade to brew here in the city. And like everybody here has mentioned, lack of action, inaction from other, you know, other, um, administrations, this administration, all of it, there's just like, it's been, it's been ongoing and we have a lot of work to, and we have a lot of work to do. Um, what I've seen in this hearing is that there's no disagreement about the problem, the root of the problem or how we got here. And there is very little disagreement about what we can do to actually change, uh, to, to, to make this better. There are two things. There are the root causes of the issues. How are the babies coming down the river? How are they getting here in the first place? And then there's the immediate need for a community that is reeling, that is struggling every single day. We, I mean, we just had a child that got stuck with a needle while he was playing football, right? So we can have the high level conversations about what the root causes are and how we tackle those root causes and how we figure out how to continue to work on this issue. And then we have to have the conversation about what happens right now because it's untenable 
you know, I think, I think Councilor Louis Jean said that it was unfair, and I think that that's a light way to put it. I think unfair is a light way to put it. It's unacceptable. And, you know, I've heard from Marla very specific requests from the community. I don't know that that's going to fix it, but I think that we, you know, I don't, I, I don't see, I, as the committee chair, I'll be recommending, right, I'll be looking at those and recommending them at the, for the um, next city council meeting. Um, and I'll work with the um, lead sponsors of the hearing order to talk about what else they got out of this in terms of like what kind of interventions the city needs to implement, right? There's the bigger conversation about how we deal with the opioid epidemic, how we deal with mass and cast, and this hearing specifically is about Clifford Park and about how we make sure that the people in that neighborhood who use that park can use that park uh, in, a way, in a way that's safe for them and that the people in that neighborhood feel safe. So I um, had questions that have already been answered that are technical questions about what's already happening there. Uh, I will sit with what I've heard from all the other, my other council colleagues and make recommendations that obviously the administration doesn't have to take because that's not how this works. Um, but I will, you know, I will be making the, the recommendation and I'll be making a concerted effort to work with my colleagues to talk about a regional strategy for this. The reality is that we all have friends that are senators at the state house. We all have friends that are state representatives at the state house. We work with them on other policy issues and this issue should not be any different. There's not a reason why the city council shouldn't be making a concerted effort to work with state partners and really figure out um, a regional strategy for how to respond to this. Um, so that is what I have for right now. Uh, I'm grateful for everybody who came to share. There is one more round of public testimony. I have two names here. I have William Cordero and Cherry Robinson. Is there anybody else who wants to give public testimony whose name I don't have? Is it possible for me to also get on again? I'm sorry, we have somebody on Zoom. Can you repeat yourself, please? It's Sue Sullivan. Is it possible for me to add a follow-up testimony? Oh, um, beautiful. Sue, you said that you would like to give, so we don't typically allow people to give testimony again, and I'm, I, I fear that if I give you another round, I will be requested to, to do that again, but what I will do okay. is that, Marla, I wanna have the panelists close us out and give one last closing statement. Can, is, is what you have a question, or do you wanna include it in your closing statement? Beautiful. So we'll have a closing statement section for the panelists and you'll get a chance to close us out. Um, and for public testimony, just to confirm, William Cordero, Sherry Robinson, and Ms. Sue, I will give you um, two minutes to give a follow-up. You have the floor now and then we'll go to the folks who are here. Thank you, thank you, Council. I appreciate the hearing today. I appreciate the level of, of seriousness that the Council is taking on all of this. And I and appreciate very much Council Baker and Council Murphy um, and Senator-elect Miranda, who've spent a lot of time down here, Councilor Anderson as well, just, you know, and how, how people see the passion that the community has for this, this issue. More importantly, I just wanted to just add on to some of the statistics. Um, we have, since the bid started, we have uh, full-time security that is supplemental to the Boston Police 24-7 in the area. And just as a, uh, to add to the statistics of the Boston Police, and we work so closely with Captain Cogavin and Peter Messina, uh, Lieutenant Messina and all, it is like lockstep um, because what we're trying to do is take care of the things that, you know, in, in, that help out so that the police don't have to deal with every one of them. We've responded to 11,535 calls for service since July. And what we've most in that is just in the in the new market mass area, you know, the that Matt is encompassed in uh, Massy is, is in. Um, I'm trying to get the number specifically for Clifford Park, but in the last few weeks, uh, about since since about a month a month or so ago, when when the, we did have the big meeting down there, and you know, more resources were going toward it. Um, our security is trying to go in the park every time anybody makes a call. To our security, we will go in and we will ask people to leave the park if they're doing um, behavior that is not conducive to recreation and quality of life issues. We have no jurisdiction, but we can ask, and and many times they leave when when our offices are there. So we are we are just present in there um, all the time too, and are are open to all the um, residents and businesses in the area. Um, our our direct number is six one seven. 665-6500 for um, those issues 
that you know do not require the, the major police 911 calls. Um, so that that being said, but what I what I really want to just touch on too is just that we've hit the nail on the head. The baby coming down the river, the and 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 the and the people that are already have already been here before, and the closing of the Long Island. Um, like you, I I knew that day what was coming down the pike as far as um, you know what we were going to see in the area with the closing of Long Island, um, and. But more importantly, um, the issues, we don't have the answers, but we, what we know is that for every person out there on the street, and by the way, I have 35 of the people who ha were in tents and all before, um, and, and shelters working for Newmarket now, they're the ones doing our street cleanup and all, and getting into better housing, and getting in, and 27 of them have gotten into full-time jobs. Ms. But Sullivan, I'm sorry, line, I just want to ask you to, to finish up because I, there are other people who haven't spoken and I want to make sure that they get a I'm chance sorry. to testify. I'm sorry, but I, what I just wanted to say is that, is that we do need to triage each person down there because some person, some need, public, some need mental health, some need addiction um, treatment, and some unfortunately do need to be sectioned and all. And it's really a one-on-one -on -one and, and we need to improve the quality of life for the residents of business down there, but we need to do it um, working with the state and, and with our new administration. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Ms. Sullivan, for coming and for sticking with us for these past um, couple of hours. We're gonna move to um, public testimony in person. Uh, I'm assuming that you're Mr. William Cordero? Yes, yes. Beautiful, can you please identify yourself for the record and you have two minutes. Good afternoon. My name is William Cordero. I'm here in support of Domingo De Rosa. If I don't know if people have seen me in the news before, but almost 12 years ago, this was me. Guess where? Mass and Cass. Okay, this is my criminal record. This is my indictment. Okay, 12 years. It'll be in October that I'll be free from that devil. Okay, I've sold drugs during the crack era, the 90s. Robert Murner used to chase me. Bobby Murner used to chase me through Mission Hill, Roxbury, Washington Street, Molina Cass, Mass Ave. Robert Murner lived behind my house in the late 80s. Ask him. There was not one needle in my neighborhood. I spent 25 years in the streets of Boston selling drugs. Okay? For the last 12 years, I've been clean. I got a substance abuse certificate. Two jobs, and you guys can't take the time to hear me, but I bet you you will hear me if I'm out there selling drugs, right? If I stand in your neighborhood and peddle drugs and shoot up, you would hear me, right? How many times you guys come out there without the press? How many times you're out there at 6 in the evening, 6 in the morning? Last time an officer got pricked, they had a cleaning team out there. They had the press, and then the mayor show up. Okay, you might as well close those blinds right now. Because what y'all doing here is not leaving these walls. Okay, y'all are sitting here pushing paperwork. You know what I see? More and more people out there. More and more dying. Okay, I still got friends out there. I lost family members. Have you ever held someone in your arms and tell them to stay alive? Lie to them while they die? Of course not. You would understand you're a cop. I'm an ex-gang member, so we know the difference between hold the brother and tell him not to die. You guys are giving people guns with this free needle exchange. Marty Wall started. Might as well give him the bullets. Would you give a bank robber a gun? Would you? Mr. Cordero, I'm sorry. No, you still have your time. If you get too close to the mic, we can't understand you. Okay, sorry. No, that's fine. I do apologize. I am the rudest guy, <laughs> the most obnoxious guy, the troublemaker. But if you lock me up for selling it, lock me up for, for fighting against it, okay? That's how I feel. I'll be out there standing in traffic. I had a state trooper tell me in my face, I hope you get run over. That's a, that's a servant. This gentleman here owns a business, okay? He's a taxpayer. He lives in the city of Boston. He pays taxes in Massachusetts. And they got to take a cop and a nine-year-old to get pricked so he can be heard. For 10 years, this guy's been, while I'm pushing dope, he's been advocating for kids. And this is what it comes to? 
close the blinds, put blinds on you, because this meeting about numbers, it takes $13 million to help 65 people. I don't have a college degree like most of the people here, but I got a degree that most of you couldn't survive. I spent 25 years in and out the penitentiary, and this is proof, okay? If you don't believe it, you can show the cop. They know about the law. I got a statement here in my grand jury minutes that says the, the drug unit goes out every evening and looks for drug dealers to arrest. This is 2011. What happened 2022? They get paid to protect drug dealers. They get paid to sit there and watch somebody fight. Someone shoot up a needle in their neck. I lived in Mission Hill in the 70s. I have not, never seen someone shoot heroin in their neck with a cop beside them in plain view at 10 in the morning, at 8 in the morning. I'm an ex-drug dealer. I don't need to be carrying Narcan. You know what it's telling me? And most of us people I know come back to the fray. Okay, because if there was drug dealers from the 90s, there would be 10,000 murders a day of mass and cast over money. We're lucky that the youth today are trying to just live on the street name, not over money. Because if it was the late 80s, and I got a, half a, I got a case here of a half a kilo of cocaine, which most of you I were in high school. Okay, if it was those days, there'd be 10,000 murders every day on mass and cast because we'd be all killing each other Vying for what? Money. But the kids did nowadays, they don't care. Mr. Okay? Pinero. And we, we can't stop at the youth. In the 90s, we got to get the youth. You know what I say? I'm 56 years old. 25 years in out the penitentiary. We better start with elementary schools. And if we don't start now, I'll see your kids out there. I'll see his kids in prison. Because drug in prison, they don't care if you're rich, poor, black, gay, white, purple. Okay? If you want to be Barney, heroin will kill you. Um, I have one more person, Sherry Robinson. Ms. Sherry Robinson, um, I think that you're the last person who has signed up to testify, is that correct? I'm looking around, yes. Um, I gave Mr. Cordero an extra minute because there was nobody else, and so you have two minutes, and if you need an extra minute, I'll give you an extra minute as well. I will give it a shot to work this into two minutes. Thank you. Um, my name's Sherry Robinson. I do volunteer outreach on Meth Mile, and I am a fan of the Boston Bengals football team that is managed basically by Domingo Storoza's whole family because they do it every day and go in. I don't know what people think about the children that are at Clifford Park, if maybe they have tougher skin or thicker skin or something, that it's okay for them to be exposed to the stuff that they see, but I have been there at the park, and I have seen three people in a circle to one-up Will's story, shooting each other up in the neck. There are kids there. I have children. I think that that would damage them. Like, does everybody agree with me? That's damaging for a child. Mm -hmm. And you people think that you're saving people by you know, not arresting them, which I'm also not for arresting them and putting them in prison. That does not help. But you're leaving them in an environment where I had a woman tell me that the hardest part about it is when she has to move her bowels into a man's mouth to make money to get drugs. And I don't want those kind of people around the kids that are at Clifford Park. So I think right now today, we can say that we need a zero tolerance policy and people that are not children playing in the park don't go in the park, period. So we can take the money that we're spending to pay everybody to be at this meeting and we can pay a police officer to stand there and enforce the fact that you're not allowed in Clifford Park. I don't care who has rules or I mean rights or whatever to go do drugs in whatever park you want to lay around in, but I feel like those children have the right not to have to experience that. They should be able to go to the park, right? Like, it's, it's just, it's completely unfair to them. I feel like, it, I mean, it's clearly a racist issue. I don't think that that's a secret, you know what I mean? And I don't think I really need to describe more about what the mile's like to you. It's, I do want to speak to one of the officers later, maybe to describe what it is like when you encounter an officer. I'm not gonna try to trash everybody right now, but. When I go up, they roll up their window, so I don't know how they would be helping the addicts while they're on the mile if the addict goes up to ask for help and the window's rolled up. I feel like that's not working. So I feel like none of this is working. I feel like we should just end the meeting. We should send the officer over to Clifford Park and end it, period. Because what Erin Murphy said is that you can't get the needles out of the mulch. So you can't let them in at night. You can't let them in ever. They just have to stay up. So I think I just did that in under two minutes. So. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Sherry Robinson, for your testimony and for all of your work. I'm going to do, um, right. want to make, first, want to make comment about the conversation around decentralizing services because it's a conversation that comes up often. And, you know, we have six, we have six locations, is that correct, Ms. Del Rio, across the city? And, you know, I, I like, I, I understand that it is uh, convenient, I would say, to position people who are in, the, in, in positions of power as somehow not being impacted by this. Um, but I live next door to a low threshold location, very literally. You can, there's my house and there's the Envision Hotel. Now, and, and I have a six-year-old kid and I live in that neighborhood. I'm the district counselor for that neighborhood. And so I'm not gonna say that we haven't had complaints. We've had, in the last year, probably a half a dozen complaints come from that area. But it's different than what we're seeing at Mass and Cass because it is less concentrated, right? Like there's only 40 people at the Envision Hotel. And so us getting six reports of needle in a year, we can clean that up. We can call 311. We can get that managed. That is something that the community can handle with people. And, and that is a result of decentralizing. That is a result of not having everybody in one place, right? And so one, as somebody who lives next door to a low threshold housing with my family, right? And like lives in that neighborhood and as a district counselor, it works to decentralize the services. It works when they are not in all in one place, right? And so, and we've seen that and I've seen that because I've been able, if I didn't work for the city, I wouldn't know that the Envision Hotel was not still functioning as a regular hotel. If I didn't drive by there and see the officer that is parked there every day, right, because I know, I wouldn't know that the Envision Hotel was happening. And that, that's, and again, we get a half a dozen complaints, we get them cleaned up, people make complaints, it happens. There is a park behind the Envision Hotel, and so we have the issues with the park there. Um, but I just want to be an advocate for the decentralization, that it matters. And the issue with that is that you know, and I think Ms. Sheree Robinson made a very solid point about this being a racial justice issue, is that we talk about decentralization, we talk about mass and cast, about how these folks are all down in Roxbury and in the South End, and then every single neighborhood mounts up against having any services in their neighborhood. And then some of our council colleagues show up and support them against having those services in their neighborhoods, right? We can't have it both ways. It is a shared problem. It's not just a shared regional problem, it's a shared city problem. And so if we know that the people of Roxbury who are black and brown people, immigrant people, low, poor, working class people are taking up the brunt of this problem and we're gonna say decentralized services, decentralized services, decentralized services, where are you gonna put them? We all have to take it on. Every single one of us has to take it on. We can't show up to community meetings and be like, yeah, we don't want that here. And then come and sit here and say that we, that, whoa, Matt, well, mass and cast is an issue. What are we gonna do about it? Like we have to actually put up a solution. And so I say that to say, I represent a very different district. The people in my district are majority white district. We have very different politics than a lot of other districts. And I understand that that matters. I understand that that political reality matters. I think that the people in my district are more partial to harm reduction and therefore might be more welcoming to having the Envision Hotel there. I understand that. I'm not saying that I somehow have it as difficult as other counselors in other districts and other neighborhoods do, right? It is much easier for me to make the case in my district to have those 40 people living at the Envision Hotel. It's much easier for me to respond to only six 311 calls instead of 100 in a neighborhood, right? So I'm not trying to get on a high horse here to say that like if I can do it, everybody can because that's not true, but we have to do hard work. We have to do hard work and it's gonna require us to do hard work. Um, we're almost finished here. Um, we have about 20 minutes. I wanna go to the lead sponsor if you have one last round of questions and then I'll go in order of arrival to the rest of my colleagues. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you to all the panelists and the speakers who came today. When I called for this hearing, I did want to bring the attention to Clifford Park and the neighbors, and I'm glad we did that today. But as we know, this problem is growing. It hasn't just started growing. It's been growing for years. Um, President Flynn mentioned his concerns at Moakley Park. Reverend White Hammond, you mentioned Franklin Park. So we know that it's not just in this area. Oftentimes, Clifford Park because of its such close proximity to Mass and Cass, your services that were down there were kind of diverted over. But now we see that your services are needed in lots of other neighborhoods around the city, not just in that pro close proximity. So wanted to make sure that we are highlighting Clifford Park today 
But as I'm leaving here, I'm thinking, are you supported enough? And can your department, Tanya, that was set up to address the coordinated effort at Mass and Cass, continue to support the concerns we're seeing at parks across the city or areas across the city? Mm -hmm. That was a question? Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually had a conversation with the budget department this week just to map out and be able to explain um, really clearly to people where the resources are. They live in, as you could see, many departments. So we want to have a big picture of where the resources are and be really strategic about deploying them. Um, as far as support, I honestly like talk multiple di times a day with most of the people here, and I feel like if I reach out to any department and need to get something done, I'm definitely getting that support. But um, just going back to like the child that was pricked yet, uh, yesterday or, or a couple days ago at Clifford Park, one one is too many. So we need to do more, and we need to be very strategic about the re resources we're deploying, and as well reaching beyond um, just city government to coordinate. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that. The attention needed at Clifford Park, and I'm hearing today and have been hearing that we need more. So if you're getting a call and you, we know we have a finite amount of services. You mentioned that if it's the day of the marathon, you may not have people at the park or other situations like that. So if you are taking your resources that we know are limited, there's a cap to it, and you're you know, exporting people to different neighborhoods, does that mean Clifford Park is not going to get the attention they need? Like, how can we ensure to these neighbors and to these district councils who I know are, and all of us here on the council working closely to make sure Clifford Park is safe and clean for the community? That yeah. we're not gonna be saying, well, we did have, you know, eight sweeps a day, but now we only have four because, not that the services wouldn't be needed elsewhere but making sure that we're not then playing too thin. Yeah, I mean, it is true that we are currently making those trade-offs, as the captain said, uh, and thank you to the captain when he does have those staffing shortages, he gives us a heads up, so we're prepared for that every time. Um, as far as the cleanup, it is true, we don't have a stationary person, so uh, we are currently making those trade-offs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Um, Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Yeah. Um, thank you. I I just want to thank Reverend um, Chief Mariama White Hammond for really centering us and what this work is really all about, right? And you know, in my time on the council, it's only been two and a half years, but I have learned so much about the way we show up and um, how we can show up differently. Um, to really move the work forward and to recognize that everybody's working through their own trauma. And a lot of us are sick and tired of being sick and tired of being what we feel sometimes, oftentimes, neglected, right? So there's all that. Um, and that all is real. And that also prevents us from really moving the needle forward because we show up in spaces with so much of that. And so I really do appreciate you bringing into the space in terms of ha having those real hard conversations about what's gonna be the give and take. And that's why I asked um, about what we've learned from other cities and what are some of the big bright ideas and best practices that are happening across the country or the world that we can really start exploring and figuring out what, is, what can we do here and what the role is of everyone, not just here in the city of Boston, but outside of this um, space to help us move in that direction. So I kind of want to end with my question that it, it did, you know, that we didn't bring it to the table, but I would love to hear what are some of those big, bold ideas that we can start leaning into or start learning from other cities that you have seen across the country or the world or anything that you are willing to bring into the space to give us time to think about. I um, am speaking on behalf of myself. I want to just be real, but it is a conversation that I've shared with people, and it's something that I've been praying about. I really do think we need to have a deeper conversation about safe injection. 
I'm, this is not me, the administration, saying what the policy is, but I, I think people should have a place to go <laughs> where they don't have to put their lives on the line and where they're not choosing any, any sort of like random place that's out there. Um, I, I've, I've spent some time in Montreal, um, and I know it's a tough thing, and I'm not saying just do it, but I think the other day I saw a woman literally laying on the ground, like, and she looked like my friend's grandma, and I hope to God she is not. But people are in a bad way, and I, I think we've got to be willing to try something that will get us, and I know, I, I, like, I know that people are concerned about it, and I'm not saying just push it down, but I, this is Mariama, the individual Mariama, the pastor, um, asking a question about something that both helps protect people, but also doesn't ask our children to be right there in the midst of it. Um, so I, I'm sure Tanya will mention many other things. I'm just telling you what's on my heart at this point. Um, because those of us who work there, I know, people, I, I know people feel like we don't care. But like, it is tough being right up in the middle of it. And sometimes, sometimes you just see people and they look broken. And their faces remind you of someone you know. And I just, I, I, don't think, I don't think there should be anything off the table. If there's evidence that it could work and it could save lives and, and get us to a different place. I do wanna thank you for, for sharing in that way, Chief. I know it's in your personal capacity. Um, I have too many guards up personally to share like that in my personal capacity, but I thank you for being brave enough. Um, as far as the administration, I will share that we are very seriously looking into all of the possible policies and the Overdose Prevention Center is certainly one that we are looking into very seriously. Um, I, this is not new. I, I wanted to give Jen a space to share about done the work that she's done in previous years to look into this specific policy choice and say that we're very closely watching what's happening in New York as uh, the first city in the United States to do this in a, I guess, <laughs> legally sanctioned way partially, and uh, obviously we have the cases that, that have happened in Europe for decades at this point and Canada. So I will let Jen share a little bit about the previous work, uh, just understanding all of the nuance about this. And in my, yeah, again, in my personal capacity, just thank you for, for sharing that. And, and yeah, this is something we need to very seriously look into. Thank you. Um, so certainly, I want to I want to start with um, we are consistently and and uh, talking to other cities uh, across the country, and sometimes outside of the country, um, and within Massachusetts around sort of best practice and innovation and creativity. Uh, the safe consumption uh, sites, uh, overdose prevention sites, as they're being uh, re referenced to now. Uh, we did have the chance in 2019, right before COVID, to go with uh, Secretary Sutters um, and the past administration um, and a team actually um, here at the city to Montreal and Toronto to visit several different harm reduction um, and peer-led uh, and medical-led overdose prevention centers. It was very um, informative and educational. And we saw them in all different settings because um, obviously the harm reduction is much more integrated into the healthcare system. Uh, saw them in different settings, um, in shelters, um, health, uh, health centers, um, peer-led ones, like I said, um, public health institutions, et cetera. So we'll continue to look at that. We're watching Rhode Island, we're, we're watching Somerville, we're watching Philadelphia, San Francisco, Seattle, and uh, obviously New York City, which is the first in, in the US. Um, on top of that, uh, you know, there's other interventions that we, we work with, actually the coordinated response team concept of this sort of central um, command. I think uh, Lieutenant Messina and the Street Outreach Unit 
um, uh, Boston Fire Department, uh, myself and some of our folks went to Philadelphia a few years ago. Um, so we, we, we were able to take a lot more trips uh, pre-COVID, but um, we are talking to other cities and sharing best practices. We get called a lot um, from other cities around, you know, what, how, did you, how did you launch the engagement center? You know, what did you learn from that? Um, but uh, we learned a lot when we went to Philly and um, other cities as well. So I'm happy to talk more about Thank kind you. of, you know, what we're learning from other cities and, and what they're learning from us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you so and much. Uh, this thing. Mejia, we have one question There's for this last yeah. round. So it was yeah, I was a gonna, question. No, it's not a question. I'm just going to end with a, a, a statement um, to everyone or chief. Um, so my, I really do appreciate the visual impact of what you shared in terms of who my cousin died of an overdose and he was alone in the shower and that's how he was found. And so there is something that when we think about the impact of what we need to do in this moment and doing so with a care and compassion lens. My daughter saw someone overdose when she was nine years old in front of her eyes. Right, so they, these are traumatic experiences that we hold on to. And so while I appreciate the, the conversation, I just think that we need to continue to center it on the humanity of those who are living these realities. And that's it, thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Councillor Regen, do you have any final question? Uh, yeah, um, I, I just wanna first also echo my thanks to um, Reverend Mariama White Hammond, um, because I think that every time that um, I'm in the area and that folks are in the area, I just think about the deep brokenness of people. And I think about the reasons why um, there's so much deep brokenness. And I think about how our systems continue to fail people. And our obligation as um, elected officials, as uh, folks working in the administration as police officers is to always be thinking about how do we help heal that brokenness. I think that's what I, I mentioned in the first end. And so I am someone who's deeply encouraged by the moves to permanent housing, by the moves to um, uh, the, the transitional low threshold housing because I, I think that's part of fixing the bigger problems, right, that we have and it's expensive um, but that's where the work is and that's where the compassion is required. And I also support a permanent stationary cleanup person at Clifford Park because young kids shouldn't be stuck with needles, right? And shouldn't have to live with that trauma. So um, I just wanna go on the record as, as supporting whatever it is that we need to do to get us out of this um, problem while recognizing that these problems are bigger than all of us, that these problems are structural and um, it's going to take a lot of us being um, uncomfortable and having uncomfortable conversations um, that are sometimes unpopular um, and that are sometimes not right for media. That's uh, not gonna get you a good sound bite, 30 seconds on channel seven or whatever uh, to support um, a safe injection site, but it's part of the conversation. So I thank everyone for being here um, and I look forward to continuing the work with all of you. Thank you, Councillor Lujan. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, do you have a final question? Uh, yes. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think that my list of questions uh, through the chair, if they can be submitted afterwards, because I know that we don't have time. Um, can I get a, a list of who is part of your team, all of the departments in the city of Boston and their roles? Um, how often do you meet? Um, what does the dashboard exactly does, if there are plan for metrics, exactly how will you um, base that on uh, evidence-based or best practices? Have you taken a look at the research from Lisbon, Portugal, and what do you think of that? Um, I know that when I mentioned it to you, Natanya, you were not too familiar, so I'm looking forward to that follow-up. Um, vision in, um, in terms of your ecosystem in terms of services already existing in the community. Um, can we, have you considered uh, doing a campaign to not just to stigmatize but to create an ecosystem 
with health services in rocks in and around Roxbury. Um, reason being is because I think that folks use catchphrases a lot and people don't actually understand what is wraparound and wraparound is not truly being implemented um, when to, the, to its meaning, to what it's supposed to be um, because of the difficulties and I understand. Um, and then uh, in terms of your programs that are existing, concentrating poverty and services in Roxbury to Councillor uh, Lara's point, she lives around, she lives next to one, I live next to two, and I live in the 10 block radius around seven in Roxbury. So I would like a list of every single halfway homes and low threshold housing in District 7, and also a list of the properties that you are looking at in District 7, and then a list of a comparison to the ones all over Boston. Um, what is the population, uh, Mass and Cass? I know you guys gave me this, but if it's in a report, it's better for me to compare. Um, what is the population in Nubian Square? What is the population on, uh, or even if you'll be addressing it, on Blue Hill Avenue? What is the, mass, the population that you're addressing in Grove Hall? What exactly numbers from each, from Nubian Square, from Mass and Cass, from Blue Hill Avenue, from uh, Clifford Park, have you actually entered into services? And I know you have some of that, but maybe not for Nubian and the, and the rest. Um, actually, no, you do have for Nubian. Um, where, um, again, where are you looking to decentralize services um, as it relates in comparison to District 7, of course? Um, what would you do differently? Do you have honest suggestions and opinions about what would you do differently? Um, or in terms of, do you think that there's a better plan um, than what you're implementing currently? And that's for the officers as well. Um, and then I would say, sorry, last two. How often, oh, can I get a report from um, Parks in terms of the Clifford Park cleanup plan? Um, how often do you clean it? How many people, security? Uh, as the officers broke down their services. Um, same for you, if I can get sort of a report of what's happening there. Um, the collaboration between state and, and city and municipal. Councilman Fernandez Anderson, can you specify when you say same for you, who you're speaking to? Oh, sorry, uh, officer, the Boston Police. Boston Police, um, plan for Clifford, plan for Clifford, safety plan, cleanup plan, um, and I know the, the cap, the, the it's going to be redone, and you mentioned about a request for a qualification in place. Um, and then the last two, do, 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 do. Oh, um, the last two, I, I, if the, to Councillor Lujan's uh, question, what is the plan to collaborate with state? Um, and then through the city, I don't know who can give me this question, Madam Chair, or this answer. Um, how often is Mass and Cass cleaned? I have to call the state a lot to do that. Um, this is my district. Um, I've told everybody, technically Mass and Cass is not my district, technically Clifford Park is not my district, but I have publicly adopted Mass and Cass as my district. I am saying that it's an everybody district problem. Um, and so I want to understand exactly how often do we clean Mass and Cass? If the state's doing it, how often is, Mass, is the state doing it? How often, same for the Clifford, same for Nubian Square. I want to go on record and state that the Nubian Square uh, plan or task force has been partially ineffective. I really appreciate Boston Public Health Commission coming in and collaborating with them. Really appreciate MGH collaborating. Um, but I've been in those meetings. There are highly unqualified people that are shaming the victim, that are just not understanding how to address this. People in treatment, advocates that are coming in and being hurt um, by their statements, we really need to look at that, and I'm interested in talking again to the advocates and everybody else on the panel. My next conversation, obviously, is gonna be about aggregating all of this data. I can't necessarily even understand it fully unless I look at all of this together and see what's happening. Um, and so that's the point of my, my um, questions today, and hopefully I will follow up with you. We have, I've created a, uh, Mass and Cass and Nubian Square or Roxbury Roundtable. Uh, Marla, would love to invite you to that. Would love to collaborate with you guys on that. Thank you so much, Madam Chair.
Thank you. And just to, just to be clear, that Councillor Fernandez Henderson was reading the questions that we're going to submit to you for the record, and that we're going to send those, and you can um, respond to um, in a timely fashion. I hope to Councillor um, Fernandez Henderson. Uh, we're going to close out. I do want to have one last round of, in case anybody wants to make any statement, Miss Marla. I know that you wanted to say something um, before we left out, and then we'll talk to the rest of the panelists. Please, you have the floor. I'd like to thank the BPD. B2 is incredibly busy. We know that. But we need quality of life support, not necessarily a 911 call. So I don't know if there's a way we could have um, some sort of like a phone line, a hotline, an email, something where we could call where it's not an emergency, but it's a serious quality of life issue going on. I mean, uh, we understand there's a lot going on in B2. And if somebody has been shot or there's been a car change, those things certainly take priority over a noise complaint. That said, a noise complaint every night of the week gets a little wearying when you don't get any sleep. But thank you so much for all your efforts. And if Lieutenant Messina, you could share the information about um, the arrests and whatnot with the council, I think that would be fantastic because I know I appreciate very much knowing exactly what's going on when you summarize it at the it, South End it, meeting. It was shared out to uh, Steve Fox and anybody else in the group. Yeah. We'll make it, we'll make it available publicly. Excellent. Um, on the idea of we can't arrest any, our way out of it, we know that, but proposals to fence the kids into the park sends a really wrong message as to who is mm -hmm. the problem here, and I don't mean problem in a negative way, mm -hmm. but children should have a right to play in a park, roll in the leaves, make snow angels, do all those things, and right now they can't do that, and putting up a fence that's seven feet tall and locked is effectively a jail to children, and that's completely wrong. Our kids need support, they need trauma support, they need mental health support in their schools and communities because the kids in Roxbury are seeing things that kids in West Roxbury aren't seeing. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you see a dead body in a park, that stays with you, it stays with me, and I'm 55 years old, not nine. Um, we need to find out why people don't want to go into treatment, what is their barrier to treatment. We need to talk to them and stop talking about them. There's no one size fits all. It's not liberal, conservative, progressive, it's humane. And we need to get to the root of that. Um, what do we do about individuals who lack the capacity to help themselves? I mean, if you are face down in a puddle of water on Mass Ave, you don't have the capacity to say, I think I'd like to go into treatment. You're unconscious. If someone is narcaned literally back to life, they're allowed to just walk away. At what point is agency? the option to self-direct care, actually neglect. There are plenty of services for users, but we also need services in the community. Domingo Starosa's nine-year-old kid who was stabbed by a needle and his family needs support. They need to hear from the city that despite how it seems right this minute, we really are trying to clean up the park. And it's horrifying that that one child was hurt, particularly four or five weeks after someone from Kevin Hayden's office was also injured in virtually the same location. Um, I, the backfilling of the roundhouse means this situation in my community is not gonna improve anytime soon. Many of you are here some hours of the day, maybe Monday through Friday. The residents are here 365, 724, and we are exhausted. From all the harm reduction at Mass and Cass, and no knock to that, but what that becomes in Clifford Park is harm creation, as evidenced by the nine-year-old child who was hurt. So it's not always harm reduction. For some people, it's life-changing, a 28-day course of drug treatment, an upset stomach, and a real fear of being in the park. And that's a horrible thing for a nine-year-old kid and his teammates to have to endure. And that's all I have to say today. I hope that we can all come together and work on this because I think we all have the right ideas and the right goals. We just need to work together to make it happen and stop operating in silos where this team does this and this team does that and they don't know what each other are doing. So I'm more than happy to work with all of you and I thank you for letting me speak and I hope you all have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much, Marla, for coming and for all of your insight into what's happening at Clifford Park but also for being solution oriented. I think that you have given us very clear direction um, and we would be remiss to not pay attention to what you've given us. Um, I just want to offer, in case anybody from the administration wants to say anything before we close out. All right, beautiful. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, thank you to the main sponsors, and this hearing is adjourned.